part of this program and a large a great part of that is the fact that Wayne County Community College donates the space for us to have this opportunity to come before you. So let me ask that so thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I welcome you if you're if you're new here to take especially my heart belongs to the next door. Um, it's open to the community and students. Um, what you just heard is something that we'd love to do in this particular uh, program is so very important, and I think I participate each day is it's key. Um, I was here last year and uh, started doing my binder. Week even, but if we need to add more chairs, add more sessions, uh, I'd like to try, try to offer that as well. But uh, welcome to the college. We are here to serve, and as the name of this program has the word community, uh, that obviously so does ours. And that's what we do. This year for, we're here for the community. So again, welcome, and if you need anything, please let me know. Thank you. Now, and, and keep in mind what he just said, because that is the spirit. This opportunity is presented to you. But without further ado, we're going to get started. And we've got one great lineup for you this morning. At the Detroit NAACP, we operate under committees. Uh, we have great leadership in our administration. We have a lot of volunteers who come in and operate our committees. One such committee is the Legal Redress Committee. And that committee is really the committee that oversees this entire legal initiative and the Crockett Community Law School. So I'm going to ask Richard Mack, who is the chair of our Legal Redress Committee, if he would come in and introduce our first speaker, the dynamic and the Honorable Kyra Harris Bolden. Richard, would you do that for us? Good morning, good morning, everyone. Right, I am always excited as a chair of Legal Redress. It's quite an honor and a privilege for me to work with the NAACP, I think for the last 20 or so years. Um, it's been some time. Um, it's, you know, so important for you all to be here for you all to spread this message about getting information about a legal community, talking to that we get engaged in politics and both politicians, both the judges as well. You know, and the politicians have an impact on all of our lives, but the impact that a judge has, and the impact that the legal system has on each individual life will touch you potentially in greater ways than any politician can do. The ruling from that judge, the lawyer, the representation given from that lawyer, is going to have an impact on you, good or bad. 
more so than I think most anything else in our system of jurisprudence. And so it's critically important for you to have an understanding about the nuts and bolts of the legal system and understanding about the specifics of the various issues of the law that you're going to be learning about over the next four weeks. So please continue to comment, please continue to like uh, your families, your friends, uh, share it on, on the social media apps. And so I'm going to introduce, i uh, probably introduce Justice Kyra Harris Holden. In many ways, uh, I think she really embodies what we want as a Supreme Court Justice. Um, I've served uh, with the Democratic Party for a number of years, a couple of caucuses combined, and we looked at different uh, judicial candidates or people who wanted to be Supreme Court Justice. And so there's a lot of vetting involved. Um, but her work and her, her bio, I won't go through the whole bio, but it's it's in the uh, reminder there. And, and it's really impressive to be 35 years young yeah. and to have such an impressive resume. Um, you know, graduated, of course, from law school, and then her work in the criminal justice system as a criminal defense attorney. Um, and then not only that, but she went on to do civil work at the largest African-American-owned law firm in the state, Lewis and Lundy. And so having someone who does both criminal and civil and an understanding of both systems is critically important. And then she went on to get an understanding in the state legislature, she was a state representative, where she did work on criminal justice reform, uh, including passing the laws about uh, first to wrongly convicted getting greater justice. So to have someone who understands civil, criminal, and then legislative work. And then of course, she was appointed as a justice of the Michigan Supreme Court uh, by uh, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And, and her age is important because now justices in the Michigan system are aged out. So for having someone who's there in 35 years, she's got a lot of, of, of future to where she can have a good 35 years old, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, so she's got she's got 35 years left. So she's got a lot of in her her future to where she can have an impact, bringing her civil and criminal experience to the law. So without further ado, I greet you to Justice Kyra Harris Bolton. I'm pulling double duty because I have a clicker and I will be reading. So we'll see if I can multitask this morning. I did not have coffee. I asked for grace. But good morning and thank you for inviting me to spend some time with you today. I'm so pleased to speak about our court system, a topic that I'm very passionate about. And not just because the judiciary is where I work, but because the court system tends to be the least known of our three branches of government. I know that firsthand, having been in the legislature. Um, but understanding how our courts work is important for everyone who lives in Michigan. Improved understanding helps to drive community engagement. Improved understanding helps to encourage change that strengthens access to justice. And improved understanding helps to build public trust in our branch of government. After all, I can't do my job without the trust of the public, and that trust is so precious. So I'm glad I can bring some transparency to what we do today. But first, I want to share a little bit about my background and how I came to the Michigan Supreme Court. So um, I, as stated in my bio, I won't go over all of that. Um, but I did serve as a judicial law clerk in Wayne County Third Circuit Court to the Honorable Judge John A. Murphy. And I think that that's important because he is the longest serving Black judge in the state of Michigan's history. And so that is where I um, started my legal career. I did criminal defense work before that, but that's where I was trained as a neutral. And I had a wonderful, wonderful mentor in Judge Murphy. Then I went to practice with Lewis and Monday, a civil litigation firm, and then I decided to run for the state legislature in 2018. Never uh, ran for office before, 
definitely was the underdog with five opponents. Um, but in my primary, I got 45% of the votes. And so that gave me a lot of confidence going forward. So we hit the ground running. Um, and I was able to get five bills passed into law during my tenure in the legislature. And okay, yes, so that was one of the bills we got passed into law signed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And so how did I decide to run for Michigan Supreme Court? Two ways, but I will get into a little bit more. But as many of you know, I ran for Michigan Supreme Court last year. Uh, while I was pregnant, by the way, shout out to the parents and the mothers in the room. Um, and I still had a full time job in the legislature. And I think that's gave up this opportunity to run for Michigan Supreme Court because I was pregnant, right? You know, women in this room, parents in this room, you know that decision that you have to make. Are you willing to take a big risk, do something while you're trying to start your family? And at first, I was opposed to doing that. Um, but then I realized, what message would I be sending to my child if I said no to this opportunity to make change for the state of Michigan and make change for her future. And I realized I couldn't do that because I, I couldn't be a hypocrite in that way. So um, I took on the biggest challenge of my life thus far and decided to run. And um, if, if you know me, you know I put everything I had into it. I gave you all my firstborn, okay? Um, but no, I, I ended up uh, losing. Um, so I, I, I was in a race with two incumbents. It's very hard to unseat an incumbent. And so I lost that race. Um, but unbeknownst to me, um, in August of last year, Chief Judge Bridget Mary McCormick decided that she was going to step down. And I even said, Bridget, you could have told me you were going to do that, but it was all good. And so um, there was a vacancy on the court. And uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer appointed me to be uh, the first uh, Black female judge on the Michigan Supreme Court in its history. So thank you. So that's a little bit of, of how we got here. And again, I will explain the process of uh, running and appointments a little bit more uh, later on. I also want to share a very important part of my background and the reason I first decided to run for Michigan Supreme uh, or to run a law school, rather. Um, I've often um, I've often told the story of my great grandfather Jesse Lee Bond, Jesse Lee Bond and how the injustice that he faced inspired me to act, to get involved, to be in the, uh, the justice system. And here's a photo of him. So my great-grandfather, Jesse Lee Bond, was a 20-year-old cotton farmer in Tennessee, and he was lynched in 1939 for asking a store owner for a receipt. His cause of death was declared an accidental drowning, and his uh, murders were never brought to justice because they were acquitted of the crime because of the designation of a being an accidental drowning, uh, which obviously clearly was not. And so this um, injustice um, that my great grandmother shared with me fueled my drive to pursue justice in my work. Um, so I earned my law degree and defended the rights of those accused and advocated for criminal justice reform. And now I try to work to ensure that our justice system is fair for all. And the people in this room, the people watching online and everyone in the community and this photo shows a mural that was painted in my honor at Dawson Elementary in Detroit, which was incredibly moving for me. Um, and it just exemplifies how tragedy can turn from into inspiration. And so I say that my family has gone from injustice to capital J justice. Now that I'm here on the bench, I want to share some noteworthy facts about my time on the court. Uh, here are my female colleagues from left to right, Justice Megan Kavanaugh, 
Chief Justice Beth Clement and Justice Elizabeth Belch. Uh, Chief Justice Bridget Mary McCormick is also in the picture um, as well, as I assumed her seat. Um, and she had the pleasure of swearing in as well. And she actually gave me a lot of her back. If any of you saw that video, and she zipped me up like I was going to school and sent me on my way. It was wonderful. Um, and let me see. And that is um, Inauguration Day being officially sworn in. So there were two swearing ins. Actually, that's the unofficial one. Either way, I was sworn in. <laughs> Oh, and then just some facts. I am the 116th justice in the state of Michigan's history. I'm the 14th woman. 14th woman. First black woman. And this is the fifth time in the court history that women have held the majority on the court. So we still have some work to do, okay? Okay. So the judicial branch is one of the three branches of government created by the state constitution, much like the federal government. As I previously mentioned, I served as a state representative before becoming a justice. So I have worked in two out of the three branches. And if I become governor one day, then I have worked in all three. No, I'm just joking. Okay, but I've worked in two of the three branches of government. Um, just to remind folks of the separation of powers, the legislative branch makes the laws. And so, um, sorry to say, when you, uh, you but some people come to me and they say, What are you doing about this issue? And I say, I'm in the judicial branch. You're going to have to talk to your legislature, legislators. It's not that we're trying to be um, evasive, but we uh, cannot talk about issues. That is for the legislative branch that makes the laws. The executive branch enforces the law. So everyone knows that uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer is our governor. And so when the legislature sends her a, a budget, she is in charge of approving. So she can sign it off and say it's okay, or she can veto it. And then the legislature will have to start all over again. Um, and my branch interprets the law. I just want to be very clear. My branch interprets the law. So if a statute comes to us and it is very clear about its intent and we make a ruling, don't be mad. that can happen within the language. Imagine how expansive our statutes would be if we tried to incorporate every single case that might happen. So it's meant to have gaps. And so the judiciary interprets those gaps based upon the statutory language and based upon a real, um, relevant case law that has occurred. And we try to match our facts to other cases to see what the outcome should be. And so that is the creation of power. So the judicial branch does not make the law. The um, governor does not uh, develop the budget. That is for the legislature. So separation of powers is everyone stays in their lane to make it short. Here is an illustration of the judicial branch structure. You will see the Supreme Court is at the top of the pyramid. Under that is the Court of Appeals, and under that are the trial courts. Uh, there are three types of trial courts, the circuit courts, the district court, or municipal courts, and the probate courts. To explain further, our judicial branch has the power to interpret and apply the law. The judicial branch decides what laws mean and how the facts fit the law, and it interprets the law to resolve disputes in the form of court cases. Now, here's another way to explain, in plain terms, what we do. Is the person guilty of a crime? Does a person or company owe money? Who should take care of a child? 
These are the types of disputes that can be resolved in the court system. The judiciary is made up of three levels of courts and three levels of responsibility when it comes to law and diplomacy. The trial court, outside the side of the field, the higher court. The court of appeals looks at the case again and asks for the rules and laws followed. Cases often stop at the level of appeals. And again, cases often stop at the level of appeals. But I can appeal to the highest. Court, Michigan Supreme Court in this case, and it's the final word on state law. Unless there is a conflict, all seven justices look at every case. We actually vote, majority wins. Um, but we only hear the most difficult cases, those that are applicable to the whitest population in our state. Once the Supreme Court issues a decision, all lower courts must follow that decision or precedent. So all similar disputes are resolved in a similar way. And that is how we try to achieve justice. Then going forward, people in courts know what is expected under law in Michigan. So just to add a little bit to that. We did about 200 or so Court of Appeals, we decide which cases we're going to take up via vote. So all seven justices, we can do what's called a hold and we bring it before the body. So the majority of justices have to agree to take up a case and, um, and how we're going to dispose of that case. Um, a lot of cases are disposed of before we even hear about it. So we don't necessarily take up each and every case. We take up the most important and the most impactful cases in the state of Michigan. Um, so some, somebody will come to me and say, I'm going to appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court. Okay. We all have to, we have, by majority, we have to we agree to take up the case. Um, So more on that. Now you might be wondering how many cases come before each type of court. Here's a look at the caseload numbers in Michigan from last year. And if you add all that up, the total is pretty amazing. Michigan courts handle between 2.5 million and 3 million cases each year. So um, I, I I think we talked about how important judicial the judicial branch is. 3 million cases being disposed of each year impacting your rights because each of those cases could potentially um, tell a judge. No one told me to smile and I'm still upset about it. I call this my resting bench phase. Um, photo. Um, the Supreme Court is known as Michigan's Court of Last Resort, and it consists of seven judges or justices. The justices elect a chief justice among their peers um, every other year. And I would just like to say, and I'd like to address this because a lot of people don't know, the chief justice of the Michigan Supreme Court is a, an administrative role. So the chief justice doesn't have extra voting power, doesn't have any additional power and any of the other justices as far as the of the cases, but really just runs the meeting um, and make sure every make sure everything is timely, does some, some court admin uh, because I've gotten questions about that. So I just wanted to uh, address that. Um, so they, they don't have any extra power in what cases we take up. We all vote, we all have an equal vote in that. Um, the cases filed in the Supreme Court come from litigants primarily seeking review of decisions made by the Michigan Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court only hears oral arguments from October until May every year, and they have until the end of July to issue their decisions. However, they work all year round. We do. <laughs> Preparing for oral arguments, conferencing to decide cases, and setting administrative rules that trial courts follow. And just a note on that, I came in January 1st of this year, 
Our first conference was uh, January 3rd, and our first oral argument was January 8th and 9th. So uh, they did not give you a reprieve because you're the newbie on the court. It's, it's, it's full, you're in there. And then by July 31st, um, I had written three majority opinions. One was um, unanimous. And so we're very proud of our work so far on the Michigan Supreme Court. We also have another court called the Michigan Court of Claims, uh, which operates under the uh, Court of Appeals. Four Court of Appeals judges, including a chief judge, are assigned to the Court of Claims by the Michigan Supreme Court. It is not a typical appeals court. The Court of Claims is a court limited, um, limited jurisdiction that hears and determines all civil actions filed against the state of Michigan and its agency. In other words, if someone wanted to sue a state-funded university or a state department, for example, the lawsuit would be here. Each claims case is heard and decided by a single judge. The decision of the judge can be appealed to the Court of Appeals. I know Chief Judge Bill McConico will be talking more about the role of district courts. Um, I have been asked to talk a little bit about the role of circuit courts. The circuit court is the trial court with the broadest powers in Michigan. In general, the circuit court handles all civil cases with claims of more than $25,000 and all felony criminal cases. Circuits have family divisions and handle all cases regarding divorce, paternity, adoption, personal protection actions, emancipation of minors, treatment, and testing of infectious disease, safe delivery of newborns, newborn name changes, juvenile offenses, and delinquency, juvenile guardianship, and a child abuse and neglect. In, in addition, the circuit court hears uh, appeal, court, appeal cases from other trial courts or from administrative agencies. The friend of the court office is part of the family division of the circuit court and handles domestic relations cases where minor children are involved. There are 57 circuit courts in Michigan, and these are typically funded at the county level. Circuit court judges are elected for six-year terms. Wayne County residents are served by Third Circuit Court, which is mainly based in the Coleman Young Municipal Building, but also has other locations in Detroit. Here shown is Chief Judge Patricia Lazard. The other court type is probate court. This is where wills, estates, trusts, guardians, conservatorships, and orders of treatment of mentally ill, developmentally disabled persons are handled. There are 78 probate courts in Michigan, and these are typically funded at the county level. Probate judges are elected for six-year terms. Wayne County Probate Court operates out of the Coleman Young Municipal Center in Detroit. Shown here is Chief Judge Freddie Burton. And I would just like to say, judges get six-year terms. The Michigan Supreme Court judges get eight-year terms. We're talking about a long period of time where people will be disposing of cases, right? So we have to really pay attention. See some familiar faces in the audience. <laughs> um, now that I've talked about the judicial branch, you might be wondering how someone becomes a judge. And there are two ways to become a judge or a just, justice in Michigan. Through a statewide election or appointment by the governor, but even if you are appointed initially, you must run for election to stay in that post. Here I share photos of some of the Detroit judges, including 36th District Court Chief Judge Bill McConnell, uh, Judge Shannon Holmes, and Circuit Court Judge Edward Joseph and Judge Kathleen McCarthy on the right. Here's a question you might you might know the answer to. Um, how or does anyone know how long judges can serve in Michigan? We've already talked about that. Sorry, it was in my notes. <laughs> so the answer is judge must serve less than seventy less than seventy. Age at the time of election. 
election or appointment in Michigan. This is unlike federal judges who can serve for the rest of their life. Um, an example of an appeal, uh, Chief Justice, Chief Judge Elizabeth Fleischer, recently announced that she was stepping down, allowing the governor to appoint the seat. The governor appointed will have to run in the 2024 election. Judge Fleischer is stepping down because she will turn 70. And just another note on that for my particular journey, um, Chief Justice Bridget McCormick stepped down two years into her eight year term. So, because I was appointed, I will have to be on the ballot next year. But according to our state constitution, I will also have to assume the term of Chief Justice McCormick. So, I will be on the ballot in 2024 and 2028 before I can run to get an eight year term. So, just like I know. How that how that works. Um, if you election outright and you're not taking a partial term, then you get the six year or the eight year term. So you'll be seeing me a lot. The state court district office is responsible for the areas that help trial courts operate each elementary for supporting and guiding the courts in their region. This ultimately benefits the people our courts serve, people just like you, by making our courts more sensible, efficient, and transparent and engaged. KO, regional administrator, provides feedback to trial judges and staff regarding the performance of their courts relative to statewide performance measures. Regional administrators also provide oversight and management assistance. And specifically relevant to the audience today, they receive complaints about the administration of court, not about the case outcomes, but the administration of justice. Finally, they help share and encourage best practices among the courts and their region. There are so many special initiatives that scale works to advance, so the judicial branch works better for everyone. For instance, the Justice for All Commission is working to increase the public's access to civil litigation, civil legal system, the civil legal system in Michigan. Um, their focus is more legal aid resources, additional ways to solve problems, and a level playing field to help people navigate civil legal matters without an attorney. For example, the commission has sponsored research that found every dollar invested in civil legal aid generates nearly $7 in benefits for the community. Think of all the legal aid lawyers who have helped with to homes during the pandemic. If you're interested in learning more about the judicial branch, I encourage you to check out our website. Courts.mi.gov. Allison Court encourage you to schedule a tour of the Hall of Justice in Lansing so you can visit our learning center. It's very, uh, it, it, it's very cool uh, and it's very kid friendly as well. Um, the Lansing, the learning center is a pretty cool place to learn of how our courts work. Um, it's almost 4,000 uh, square feet of um, full of information and lots of interactive exhibits for children. Um, also, use your local courts as a resource, reach out and ask for a tour to plan a visit, find out what events are offered in your community. Am I allowed to say, am I taking questions? Uh oh. Oh, I did my job. Wow, no questions. <laughs> A justice of the Supreme Court is the fact that she works. I ain't gonna tell you how many hours Monday to Friday. Today is Saturday. She's here for y'all. I do see her first. Are you gonna go on that first woman on the court walk? Oh, wow. Oh. 
know me. I, 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 am, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still new. Uh, so I've been on the court for uh, nine months. Um, but I will ask someone about that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was just information uh, that was not um, a ploy or um, that was not an ask. Um, but I will say that this has been so I, I, I was in the state legislature, right? So I, I ran two elections. Again, this is just information um, because I'm not currently running for office. Um, and my third election was last year. And so if any of you know me, if you've been following me, um, I'm never really going well. So, <laughs> so that, that's not something that you that you have to worry about, regardless of my, my status of, of when I will be on the ballot. Um, one of the things that is very important to me is that the community see me um, in, in an authentic way and, and not because, you know, because I, I want to keep my job, but because Particularly, I want you, but also little boys and little girls to see what's possible. And that's always been the most important thing for me. So I will be around because I think it's important, um, not because I'm asking something for me. Um, oh, thank you. Can you give us an idea of some of the legal issues that are going to be coming before the Michigan Supreme Court, particularly those that may be of interest to the NAACP? Thank you. So I will say, I, I can't tell you exactly, but I will say that we have oral argument that is live streamed once a month. We had oral arguments this week uh, that was live streamed. You can also visit the court if, if you if you want to sit in, it is open to the public. So we have four arguments once a month on a Tuesday and Wednesday. So you can see for yourself the types of cases that we are hearing. Um, broadly, I will say that we are hearing a lot of issues concerning um, uh, in a criminal in the criminal realm. Um, we are hearing a lot of, I should say, we're hearing. Again, I've only been there for a short period of time. What seems like maybe a lot to me may not actually be a lot. Um, but termination of parental rights um, cases, um, we we are seeing um, more family issues, um, custody types of, of cases coming to the court, um, and then your general. Um, you know, car insurance disputes as well. And so I, I can't exactly say what might be of interest to this organization. I can't say what's coming down the pipeline. But what I can say is um, I really encourage you all to just, um, if you have time, if you're available, to tune in to our live stream so you can see uh, who's asking what questions, how they're asking, how they're treating litigants, and what issues that will be disposed will be disposed of in the near future. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jeremiah Mars, class of 2022 here at Wayne County, downtown campus. Um, I had a question about um, an ICPC. And it's, um, would you be um, sufficient and able to answer this question about an ICPC between the state of Kansas and the state of Michigan that can be um, it's an interstate compact between two states. Is a custody case I have. I cannot speak about any individual cases. Okay, yeah. I understand that. Um, and I'm also not allowed as, as a judge. We, we have judicial payments. Yeah. Um, we are not allowed to speak about our personal opinions on issues, how it might go. We can't speak about pending cases, or um, we really can't even answer hypotheticals. Again, they're trying to be evasive. If you're in the room, am I right? Okay. All right. <laughs>
Yeah. This question comes from the Zoom. Uh, yeah, sorry, monitoring the Zoom chat. And the question asks, can you speak to personal persuasions and how it impacts decision making on the courts? Um, I think I actually get asked this question a lot, and I think given my background, it's a very valid question. The first thing I will say is I was trained as a neutral, so I was a judicial law clerk, and so that is how I was brought into the legal system. I'm very well aware, as I stated before, uh, that we are there to interpret the law, right? If there is some type of issue with um, the clear language of the statute, then that becomes a legislative problem. And because I have been in the legislature, I'm very clear about separation of powers. Uh, we are not there to make the law. And so we read the law, we, we try to um, get at the legislative intent of the law, then we look at relevant case law to try to make the best decisions possible and try to give people a fair opportunity to be heard. That is our job um, as judges and justices, and I take that very, very seriously, especially because I have served in another branch of government. Um, and so that is how we um, approach the law, and it is not about our own personal opinion. It is trying to understand what the people that represent you, your state legislature, was trying to get at when they enacted that particular law. Talking with uh, Judge McConnell, but uh, in terms of be because you came out of the legislature, uh, and there's obviously a position on on every topic, at least of course you have a, a personal opinion and a political opinion. How do you deal with the pushback that you'll get now that you're in? in see what you're doing. My job is a different job. I, you know, I, I understand, I get it, and I know a lot of people still see me. Uh, in, in a certain role, in a certain light, in a certain faith, I am in a different job um, where uh, it is not my job. It is specifically not my job to have a personal opinion. You want your judges to be unbiased. You want your judge to go into a case with an open mind to look at all the facts, the evidence, and all the information available to them in that particular case and not be um, influenced by outside uh, decision making. And so, again, I was trained as a neutral. Uh, it was my job to do research and writing for my judge at Maine County Third Circuit Court. I'll take that very seriously. Um, and I know that's what justice requires. Justice requires for me and all the other justices to stay in their lane. And again, if you have an issue with a particular statute and how we're interpreting it, you can always lobby your legislator or your legislature to say, hey, we don't like how these cases are coming out. We don't think that's what is intended. And you, you can um, lobby them to, to change how you believe that it should be interpreted. Question. As a practicing attorney, which I've done for probably the last 46 years before the war, <laughs> uh, I, I I take to heart the words and the philosophy of Justice Marshall, who said, I quoted it earlier, you do what you think is right and let the law catch up. That's what he was telling lawyers. So when lawyers come to you with these novel, I'll call it novel arguments that don't seem to be within the parameter of what people thought was the law. How do you react to that? I know uh, some people think that uh, judges think lawyers are crazy and foolish and all that kind of. How do you react when they come in with such a unorthodox theory uh, that it tests your neutrality? I think you should, as an attorney, present the case that is in your client's most favorable light, right? Um, as a judge or a justice, you might say, oh, you know, <laughs> that's not very good. But there have been cases um, over time um, that, that as technology has advanced, 
we get more information about something um, that the interpretation has changed. Um, there, there are cases like that. I'm not going to cite anything specifically. Um, so what I can say is um, you have to just keep um, at, at times within reason because we are under an ethical duty to present our uh, attorney to present arguments that you know that make sense. <laughs> um, but but I would say you, you have to you have to keep going because sometimes it does catch up. I would say if you look and I can say this if you look at our opinion, sometimes we do flag things for the legislature and say, hey, this is a legislative issue. It doesn't look like this might be what, what you meant, but this is according to the statute. This is how we have to interpret it uh, based upon um, our understanding of how the law should work. And so sometimes we will put in, in, um, in our opinions just, just a little flag for the legislature um, because if they change into the legislature, then that will affect how we interpret the law. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and letting me uh, speak with you this morning. Thank you, uh, Justice Bolden. Um, we are going to. You know, that was just a that was just a tease. We got some good folks coming uh, for the rest of the day. Now I would be remiss a little earlier. Uh, programs like this are available to you on the basis of leadership, and of course I'm your general counsel. But my president is the Reverend Doctor Wendell Anthony, who is a great leader, who is who is monumental and instrumental. And making this opportunity available to you. He can't be here today because he's got a funeral. He is a woman. But he's here with us in spirit today. I want to acknowledge that. Also, today, before the program's over, you'll hear from Camelia Landrum, who is our executive director. And the other thing I forgot to do is mention that there are some folks here who we ought to recognize. I know I see Judge Demetria Brew here in. And there are uh, other persons here as well. We're running a little behind. So I want to ask Richard if he'll come up again. And we're going to introduce Judge McConaughey, who will, who will continue the program. All right, all right. Um, let's, give, let's give it up again for Justice Bolden. I think it's, it's you know, and, and truly mentioned it, it's really noteworthy that you have someone of such, such high regard who comes to speak to you about the day to day, the nuts and bolts of the law. That's really what's so impressive about what the, what the branch does with this. Uh, George Crocker Community Law School. I mean, you're getting the chief judge, you're getting the Supreme Court justice, you're getting some, some very highly regarded individuals who are coming to their communities to educate you in the law. And so I just, I'm so happy and thankful that every year we do it, and every year they come out, and every year uh, the attendance gets greater and greater because people are seeing the value of making sure that they're educated. You're being educated by very intelligent people. Um, this next individual is a, a friend of mine. He's been a friend of mine for a lot of years. Um, uh, Judge uh, William McConaughey. Um, I remember when back in New Orleans, I'm my age, 20 some years ago, he was running for the state legislature and you know, we, I bumped into him and we met up and we became friends and we supported him. Uh, just a great all around guy. One of the unique things about people in positions like him, he's now, you know, again, the, the, he's currently the chief judge of the fifth busiest court in the country. 
I mean, think about that. I mean, think about all of us going through the six district court, whether it's tickets, whatever criminal issues, or whatever real estate, whatever issue you have. Uh, there's a lot that they do with their court. And to be responsible to run the whole thing administratively and move on cases, uh, it's a great, great undertaking. And so it takes the type of person who's got, again, the very level of experience that Judge McConnell has. He was a state legislator for six years. He was successful with it. And we now bumped into the building and we uh, supported him and we has been behind him ever since. He was successful with that. You know, gone through and done a lot of great work there. And then um, he's appointed to the 36th District Court by Justice, by uh, I'm sorry, Governor Jennifer Granholm. And then you have to be appointed to the Chief Judge by the Michigan Supreme Court and with him as well. And so beyond that, he was also, I forgot about this, he was a city Holland Park attorney. So he was the lead lawyer for the city of Holland Park, in addition to so you know, being in the legislature, being the top executive at the city, you know, now leading the court. It's so important that you have people with varied level of experience so that when you come before them. You know, they're not just on an ivory tower and not understanding what you're dealing with day to day, but he's been there, he understands. He's talked to the constituents, he's worked with constituents, he's been a constituent, he's been in the country. And so he understands the issues that people are dealing with. So uh, again, Supreme Court, I mean, um, hopefully I'll say that. What do you say, David? Chief Judge William McConaughey, I present him to you, and I'll stop rambling about it. Oh, I Whenever I come here and I uh, and I, I see Richard, it lets me know we're not young anymore. Because we were we were in our twenties when we when we started this, and so uh, and there was no gray hair and, uh, and all of that good stuff. So again, I'm Bill McConnell, I'm the Chief Judge of Thirst District Court, and it's an honor to be here at the George uh, W. Crockett Jr. Community Law School. Uh, this is the third time that I've been asked to present, and it's always an honor. I want to thank Dr. Ivory and thank the executive director, and I want to thank uh, General Counsel of NACP for having me come back. And, excuse me, I, I, I had a class this morning, and I saw my, I heard my voice starting to go out. I said, this is not good, but we're going to just put the microphone a little closer. Um, the reason why it's an honor to be here, um, first thing is that who this is named after. Uh, George W. Crockett Jr. is one of my three girls. Um, and you know, whenever I present here, I always start out the same way. Uh, Charles Hamilton Houston was my legal inspiration and a person who was the former head of uh, NACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, George W. Crockett Jr. and Thurgood Marshall. Uh, for those who've been in my chamber, uh, some of my students are here and the judges. Um, I have pictures of them because every day, like going to my chamber every day, I zip up my robe. I want to I wanted think about the men who came before me and their struggles and their challenges. And it keeps me grounded and keeps me inspired. Um, I tried to follow the path of George W. Crockett Jr. Uh, he's a proud, he was a proud graduate of Morehouse College. Anyone who knows me, I talk about Morehouse on a daily basis. Um, he was a 1931 initiate into Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated Pi Chapter. Um, I followed in those footsteps. Uh, he came back home, uh, and he was a judge that was not just a judge in name of um, our general counsel stated. He had a chance, and he made rules and laws, not made laws. He interpreted laws and took actions that were controversial, but he was doing the right thing. The fact that he held court in the church. The fact that he would go to a jail, he would go to a precinct to, thank you, I don't know if it's going to help, but he, he would go to a precinct and hold court there when there was an injustice, when there were things dealing with stress, things dealing with other police uh, misconduct. And so it is that is the inspiration and the type of judge that I have always wanted to be and I strive to be. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Ivory for again opening up this uh, wonderful school. Uh, for such a law school to be uh, held so that people in the community can come here, they can watch on Zoom, but they can come here. And I want to thank my students who are here. So 
Uh, all the my students in the book stand up for a second, not to be serious. I know, I know. Come on, come on. So there is an amount of studies uh, speak for the hearing. And these are uh, your next uh, future paralegals and lawyers who will be up here presenting in a few years. We know eventually we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have change. He's gonna have to he's gonna have to retire eventually. After you get 60 years of being a lawyer, so we got we got, we got to come by. Uh, being the chief judge of Thursday's district court um, is a is a big undertaking. And I'm gonna actually go off of my I'm gonna I'm gonna veer off my presentation really quickly. One thing that Justice Bolton uh, stated. And in her slide um, was that the Supreme Court hears 1,200 cases a year. The Court of Appeals hears 5,000 cases a year. Probate Court, 65,000. Circuit Court, 220,000. And District Courts, 2.2 million. Okay. Now, of that 2.2 million, half of that's coming from 36 District Court. Okay. So I want you guys to realize that 1,200, 5,000, 65,000, 220,000, and then 2.2 million. And half of that's coming from 36. So that's the type of work that is happening at 36 District Court. And that is why I always say that we are the people's court. Because we are the show of hands. How many people have ever gone to the Michigan Court of Appeals? How many people have had to come to 36 District Court? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you wanted to come or not, you've had to come to 36 District Court. It could be a traffic offense. You could be a landlord and you're having to get your property back. It could be a small claims case. There's something happened with a mechanic. Where your interaction is going to be is going to be at the 36 District Court or a district court level. And so it is very important that you have an overview and you actually know what happens at your court. Because again, the district court is the people's court. Um, we have 29 judges at 36 district court. We have six magistrates at the 36 district court. We have 300, probably 300, 350 employees at the 36 district court. And again, we have to go through a million people coming either in our door, our doors, or on our Zoom uh, proceedings. As uh, uh, Richard Mack stated, we are the largest district court in the state of Michigan, and we are one of the largest district courts in the state, uh, I mean, in the United States. The court serves multiple uh, areas, so we're going to go over administration first. The court administrator serves as the clerk of the court and is responsible for administrative manage, uh, management duties and dealing with non-judicial functions. So this is including human resources, information technology, fiscal services, case flow management, jury services, and house counsel. House counsel, that is the court appointed attorneys that you have. Now, we also have a, uh, a new process at, 30, at 36, let me get to that a little bit more we get to the landlord tenant area because we are not only providing counsel for criminal cases but for landlord tenant cases also um now what i do as the chief judge um and since i have one of my judges in here judge Dimitri Brew, Brew, i'm going to speak very uh be very uh delicate on this i always tell people i'm not the judge's boss okay you know i can't go in and tell a judge how to rule I had a situation two weeks ago where um, a judge on the felony docket uh, dismissed the case. And the Wayne County prosecutor was very hot, the assistant prosecuting attorney, not your word. And, you know, they came into my courtroom and they wanted me to overturn this judge's decision. I said, I, I said okay, let's, let's call the case. I had to bring the case up. I had to tell him on the record, you don't overturn judges' cases, okay? You have an appellate remedy. But you have to go through that process and appeal the case. But I don't have the authority to determine what judges are on which dockets. So I, um, against Judge Bruce, uh, I moved her from the civil docket to the land lieutenant uh, division, which she's doing a phenomenal job. And so even though she didn't want to go back there, hey, thank you, clap for Judge Bruce. Even, even though she didn't want to go back to the land lieutenant division, I knew that the wisdom that she had was necessary to dealing with COVID. Because we had a lot of we had a lot of changes that happened in our court, 
and we have a lot of new judges. And so part of what I have to do is I have to make the composition of these divisions. So you can't have five or six new judges in a, in a division without having someone with seniority, someone who's been there, someone that can help mentor them. And so that's why I brought Judge Brew over again against her will, but she's not, she's got a phenomenal job. Um, we um, I also, I pick what's called a presiding judge. And that presiding judge is kind of like a mini chief judge of that division. So you'll have a presiding judge of the criminal division, felony, uh, the, excuse me, the traffic misdemeanor division, the land lieutenant division, especially court. And so those judges meet with the judges. We're trying to meet on a monthly or bi monthly basis. We go over situations that are impacting it. Um, but you have someone and another layer to work with the judges. Uh, again, and we also something that we we uh, started since I became a chief judge uh, is to have a mentor system because we had so many new judges to have someone to be able to talk to them. When I became a judge in 2010, um, 36 district court judges didn't talk a lot to each other. I kind of got thrown in, and you know, I you know I think I'm pretty smart, but you know, you zip up the road, but you just handle the cases. It's, it's not that simple though. It's not that simple, especially if you've now heard certain cases. Uh, you need someone that you can talk to. You know, judges don't have all the answers. And uh, one thing I always tell young judges is that um, the one person that's necessary for the court to proceed is you. So if you don't have an answer, stop. Go back into your chamber, look it up, call somebody, and you don't have to let them know you don't know the answer. But it's, it's okay. And if you are in any walk of life and you think you have all the answers, you don't have the answers. And that's a real issue. Those who don't know what they don't know is real dangerous. So you don't want to judge on the bench faking it, faking the law, or, or just making the decision without having the legal basis. And so it's always good to have a mentor. Um, one of the other things that I'm proud of, actually, I should have started with this. Um, I've been a professor here at Wayne County Community College for the last 12 years. And the one thing that when I started here, I found a mentor. I found someone in the criminal, I started out only teaching criminal justice classes, wanted to talk to professors who've been doing this. What are some best practices? What are some things that work? What are some things that work with trying to recruit students? All of that thing. You always want to talk to people. So never be afraid to ask questions or to get help. What? Let's get back to the presentation. Uh, we're going to go through uh, the divisions right now. Uh, we're going to start with the civil division. And before I continue with the civil division, I do want to recognize one of my neighbors, uh, Senator Adam, uh, Adam Olier. Uh, he's been a present to you a little bit later, but uh, he's, we got a lot of legislators that have been here doing some presentations today. So I'm proud of that. Adam is now, um, Justice Bowden talked about being in two branches of government, going from the legislative branch to the judicial branch. Adam went from the legislative branch to the executive branch, and so he's gonna talk about that. I went from the legislative branch to the executive branch, and I have a part to the judicial branch. So I, I've actually done all three, so I got y'all beat right now. So, but, uh, so, uh, so the civil division, uh, the general civil division, and I, these students should be able to, we just, we just talked about this this morning. The difference between general civil division and district court and, and circuit court is we handle cases that are 25,000 and below. Circuit court is 25,000 and above. Um, any action that it can arise from anything from an overdue account, rental securities, um, repair bills, physical damage, breach of contracts. Um, and Included in the civil division overall, we have a separate landlord tenant division. Since I would say 2020, of all the divisions in the court, which has had the most publicity, uh, has taken the most time, mine actually, is the landlord tenant division. The landlord tenant division uh, processes many disputes between landlords and tenants regarding property within the city of Detroit. A landlord may file for an issue such as non-payment of rent, termination cases, health or hazards on the property, trespassing, land contracts, uh, and the like. Part of the reason why um, the landlord-tenant docket has been so time-consuming and so important is um, 
the 36th District Court, unfortunately, has been one of the has had one of the highest eviction rates historically in the country. Uh, when I became chief, um, there were some studies that I read from the University of Michigan that compared cities that were comparable. I say Detroit, Cleveland, New Jersey, Chicago, Baltimore, um, Philadelphia, uh, Bronx, New York. 36th District Court evicted more tenants than any of these places. And part of the reason that we had one of the highest eviction rates was because 90 to 95% of landlord tenant cases in front of us at 36th District Court, there's a lawyer for the plaintiff. Now, the person who's in jeopardy of being evicted, the defendant, was the opposite. 90% of those cases, they didn't have a lawyer. So if you have a lawyer on one side and you don't have a lawyer on the other side, how do you think those cases are really going to play out? You're going to have a higher level. You're going to have defendants negotiating with those who are trying to put them out. And as Justice Bowles heard, you said her earlier, you know, when Judge Brewer is in the landlord tenant doctrine, she may want to make some arguments on behalf of the defendant. She may want to go down there and take off the road and make some arguments. She can, she can only deal with what's coming in front of her. And so what we've done is we have worked um, with the city council, with the city of Detroit, the administration of the city of Detroit, uh, and some of our philanthropic uh, partners in the city to provide lawyers for tenants who are coming before us now. And so I, I will, you know, as one of my students, she works for city council, make sure you tell your boss that we, uh, we're giving them some shout outs right now because they got the money approved. So now we have, now we have lawyers for the tenants and, you know, there's still going to be evictions. They're still going to, you know, you still have to pay your rent. You still have to do certain things. But now it's a fair process. It's a process where you know you may have some may have some negotiated settlements. You may take partial payments. You may give a longer term to move out. But it is a fair a fair system. And so we now have agency attorneys, uh, Lakeshore Legal Aid and um, uh, and UCH that are there five days a week to help uh, the tenants and the landlord tenant doctors. So I want to want to thank all the partners who have been there. And I want to thank the judges in the landlord to the division. We had so many cases throughout the pandemic where historically there's only been four judges on the landlord to the division, but I've had to increase it by 50%. Now we have six judges because there's so many cases, but also they're so time consuming to go through right now. And in order uh, for me to make it to my car safely, I needed to give Judge Brew and the other judges some help. So I uh, they didn't want to have too much work on them. Traffic criminal. Now, the majority of the citizens that come through, they normally come through the traffic case, traffic uh, criminal docket. So we have, this is divided into two places also. So the traffic misdemeanor docket deals with just what it is, traffic cases, misdemeanor cases. And a misdemeanor case is a less serious crime, punishable by 90, traditionally 93 days or less in jail. And a maximum five hundred dollar penalty. That's anywhere from trying to your license suspended, no insurance, uh, drug trial cases, other misdemeanors that go through these dockets. Um, you know, to disorderly conduct, um, retail fraud cases. And so we have, um, you know, we have about like, ten judges, no, twelve judges that handle those cases. And then we have a felony division. So every felony that is committed in the city of Detroit comes through 36th District Court and the judges on that docket make a determination whether there's probable cause for the case to go to Wayne Circuit Court over to Frank Murphy Hall of Justice for a trial. So it is not a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. It is, I always tell people, beyond a reasonable doubt is about maybe 95% certain that this crime was committed. Probable cause is a much lower burden, it's about 51%, more likely than not. But every case does not deserve to go to trial. And so our judges make a determination whether there's probable cause for the case to exist. And so, again, every felony case that happens in the city of Detroit goes through the 36th District Court. Um, we also have uh, a division that I created in 2020, a specialty courts division. 
Now, the Special Courts Division is um, is run by Justice Justice Keith, Judge Shannon uh, A. Holmes, and the Special Court Division deals with uh, our drug court. We have a veterans court. We have a mental health court now, and we have a human trafficking doctor. Drug court is just that. If a person is um, has cases on the traffic misdemeanor docket, uh, or you can even refer it from other cases, but normally the traffic misdemeanor docket, and you can tell that this person or if this person keeps stealing or they keep doing something over and over, but alcohol or drugs is the presiding reason that they're doing this. If we can get to that root cause of why the criminal interaction is happening, we can make a holistic change in that person. And so the, the, the drug court is a very, very strenuous program. And that uh, defendant will be with Judge Holmes for about 18 months. That person is going to have treatment. That person is going to have a probation officer, who we call it a caseworker. That's going to help monitor that person. And it's going to take them from being in the throes of addiction. And then we have a graduation. We have a graduation ceremony every year. And we do that at the Coleman A. Young Municipal Center a lot of times. And it is one of the most emotional things you'll ever see. You'll see family members uh, that are there, people's children. This person may not have been clean in 10 years, but they're right now. Uh, we had a situation two years ago, which was very unfortunate. We had a person that had gone through the whole program. And um, it was one week before the graduation. And person who um, she used to do drugs with was trying to get her to get back in that life and she refused and she was killed. And her sister still came to the graduation because she knew how important it was and how proud that her sister was that she had stayed clean and sober for those 18 months. And I mean, it was, I mean, it was one of those things where it wasn't a dry eye. I mean, you couldn't, but that's what we're taking people from. We have veterans, and I know um, uh, Senator Oli is going to talk about this. We have people, men and women, who have dedicated their lives to serving this country so we can have certain freedoms that we, you know, take for granted sometimes. And they come back from active duty, and sometimes they struggle with some mental health issues. Sometimes they struggle finding housing. They struggle with jobs. And unfortunately, they start committing crimes or they do petty offenses. We have a separate docket where we take those veterans and we help get them services, housing, job training, jobs. And we want to treat the symptom again and not the issues. And so the Veterans Court, um, that, that um, graduation is emotional. Uh, the two newest portions of uh, specialty court that we started since 2020, it's the mental health docket. And, and I know you guys will go through this when you're um, in the next you know, weeks. You probably will hear a lot about mental health. A lot of the issues that we have stems back to the nineties when former governor of the state of Michigan closed mental health hospitals. And what we started doing is incarcerating people that should be treated. A person shouldn't be housed in the Wayne County Jail because they're dealing with schizophrenia or they're dealing with bipolar, because that's not the place. Those sheriffs are not trained to treat someone with schizophrenia. They're there to, they're, they're trying to keep someone housed and make sure they get to court and make sure they don't harm anyone else. But our mental health docket is a diversion docket, which helps get people help and to make sure we can get them out of criminal justice, um, criminal lifestyle. And so we're very proud of that. And the last um, portion of the spell uh, we started a human trafficking docket. Um, one of the darkest secrets of the state of Michigan is we have one of the largest percentages of human trafficking in the state in the country. We have we have boys, we have girls who have been basically kidnapped or they've been uh, given drugs and then they're being sold for sexual purposes or whatever. And what when they're doing that or when they're in that lifestyle, they are committing crimes. But instead of treating them as criminals, you know, we have to figure out how do we get them out of that life and how do we work with U.S. Attorney's Office's Don Ison, uh, who was here last year, 
has done a phenomenal job cracking down on human trafficking. Um, and that we have to look, you know, we have to look at them and, and, and realize what has been done to them. And, and that this is just not a normal person coming through the criminal justice system. So um, the specialty court um, has been um, uh, named one of the top 10 courts in the uh, divisions in the country. We are a mentor, we are a mentor court right now. And Judge Holmes takes this program that we're doing at 36 all over the country. So we're one of 10 specialty court dockets that we go and mentor courts all over the country. So I'm very proud of what's happening at 36, our caseworkers and our judges. Thank you. How does um, specialty court and what comes out of our, um, our other criminal divisions uh, is the probation department. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> probation exists for the purpose of aiding in the reduction of incarceration and having an impact on our community. Uh, the probation department is responsible for, for providing community supervision to individuals who have been charged with misdemeanor offenses within the city of Detroit. Um, <clears throat> we monitor, uh, we make sure that whatever programs we're having to go through that they complete those programs. And part of the monitoring is just not a punitive nature. Again, we want to make sure that you've committed a crime. That's why you've been found guilty or you pled guilty. But what we don't want you to do is commit another crime. So probation is not is not there to punish, but it is there to make sure you're not back again. And so we we take that very seriously. Um, and we've had you know actually students here from Wayne County Community College who were trained here and have gone come on to be probation officers there. And so if you have uh, any questions concerning 36 District Court, uh, we have a good website that we maintain. Uh, if you are bored or just curious, um, you can watch the um, majority of the cases on YouTube. Um, some of our judges are no longer streaming on YouTube because you can go to the court. If you just, you know, hey, I don't, I don't know what you're doing in your personal life, but again, it's just a random Tuesday. You know, kids are at school, just want to come on down. Demetri Bruce's courtroom is on this show. Just, uh, just come on down and, ju and just watch cases because the courtroom is open. We are open to the community. And I think the best way to demystify what goes on in court is to see it. It's to see it. Come down. The also, the other way of demystifying what happens in court is that we started a community relations, uh, basically. I have a specialist that goes out to any black club meeting to that you we're invited to uh, police precincts. And so I go to those meetings and then I invite judges to go. So we just talk about like one month, we'll talk about the felony division or we'll give an update on the civil division. And just to take questions because you, you normally don't see judges in the community, but we're out there now. Uh, one of the benefits of having when meetings were just strictly on Zoom and some of my students have uh, had to deal with this, you know, I'll take a 15 minute break in class. And I say, listen, I'm going to speak to this community meeting. So I'll just turn the computer off, let them read, or they can just be a part of the meeting, close it down and get back to the lesson. You could be in multiple places, uh, but now most of the meetings are back in person. So you kind of lose that, that, that too. But check, come to our website if you have a question. Come to the court. It is your court, it is the people's court. So don't be afraid. And last thing, I don't know we talk about this. If you have any warrants, because there's someone in Zoom that's watching this and they just coughed or, you know, they took a sip of water because, yes, I'm talking to you. And there's somebody here that's Mr. the court day. Come to the court. Come down. Get your new court date. You're not going to be arrested. You're not going to jail. But we don't want people driving where the license is suspended. Even though in the city of Detroit, we're not going to incarcerate you. Get caught driving on that suspended in, in Eastwood, in Lavonia, you know, Westland. You, know, you will be finding child care. You will be having someone calling your job and, you know, because you're not going to be at work. So don't drive with your license suspended. Don't drive uh, and, and have these old cases happen because it's going to impact you uh, getting a job. And you can, you, you're, you're operating in fear because at any moment, because we know, we know there's profiling that exists, you might not have been doing anything wrong. But when they run that plate, when they run that license, 
You can't even go back to the squad car. Can't even touch the squad car. So let's not do this. So come on down, get your license together. And if you have a felony conviction that's over five years, um, I know the NACP does it. I know there's a lot of work with the city, the Wolverine Bar Association. There's various uh, uh, councils did something very recently. There are a lot of expunged affairs that are out there. Take advantage of it because you can get your you can get your record expunged, so that can stop hindering for um, for the type of jobs that you want. Uh, Senator Olier was was a big uh, big leader of that in the Senate to make sure people have a second chance. We don't want to repunish people because they made a mistake. We want people to serve their debt to society and then become a productive member of society. So work to get that expungement. If your license is suspended, come to court. Let's resolve these issues and let's keep moving. So again, I'm Bill McConnell, I'm the Chief Judge of Ferguson's District Court and proud professor here at Blaine County Community College District. And thank you for listening to me. And thank you for being I got two questions. The first question with the expungement. Um, if you know somebody um, that has already went to court to get expunged, and I know the law came in place after the uh, expungement, how would they go about getting it, uh, like going back to court again to get it re, you know, re looked at as far as if they fall under the bracket of getting it expunged, expunged now? At, at the NAACP Detroit branch, we have lawyers who provide expungement services free of charge. The way they would get it started is to go online, DetroitNAACP.org, and then you'll scroll, scroll down to expungements. You uh, put your information in or your information. And then one of our representatives will contact them and conduct an interview. And they will do their entire pass. And they tell them, well, you know, you, this, is, this is the procedure that you should follow. And we help you with that procedure at no cost. So, and the other thing about expungements is you should tell everybody you know about the expungement opportunity. Because realistically, you don't know who caught a case or when or what they got on their record. And, and a lot of people are just ashamed or embarrassed. They don't want anybody to know. Well, our work is confidential. DetroitNAACP.org. Come on in. We'll, we'll take care of it. Thank you. Read, you. you read my mind. I was trying to give you the look like, come on up. <laughs> no, and, and you know, that's why I say I know people on Zoom, there are people here that they drove here with their license suspended. Somebody in this room drove here with your license suspended. I know it. Could it happen to them? And here was a person, to, to your last point, there's a person that uh, I go to the same O'Reilly's all the time to get stuff. I can do stuff for cars. And he just said to me, well, I've known this guy for like five years. He just said to me, he's like, Judge, I speak to you outside for a second. He told me about something that happened in the 90s. And you know, he wanted to finally go about it. And he was ashamed to tell me that he had a felony conviction. And I was like, man, we could, this could have been handled because you, you only have one. It's in the, it's in the zone where this, this could have been taken care of, but people don't want to talk about it. And so I appreciate that the NACP has it where there's no stigma. No one else is going to know about it or work on it. Did you have one more? I'll have one more question, but I'd like to add to it. What if it's not in, in um, like if it's in Oakland? Can they still assist with them? Assist with helping with that? If it's not what? If it's not in Wayne County, if it's like in the state of Michigan. Okay. Um, one of the good things that, I shouldn't say good things that came out of COVID, but one of the things that came out of COVID was online virtual court appearances. So we can give me give me an example. We had a person who had been a student at one of the uh, colleges in mid Michigan, and another one in northern Michigan, 
you eat. Now, I don't go up there. Why? The judge was all right. He found the application. Uh, the person stayed in their house, opened up their computer, we opened up our computer, and we got it done. In the state of Michigan, the only thing that we can't do is outside the state of Michigan. You got to go to the other state. You can bring it to a lawyer there. And the other thing that we can't do, we can't do federal cases. Because the federal case doesn't have an expungement rule. Only the president of the United States can hurt the people. So anything in the state, any county, we can handle it for you. Thank you. Also, the next question is um, I hate to do this to you, but we, we got some other hands up. Hold on. I'll step in the hallway. Samara, um, I really don't announce it when I'm the kind of work that I do, but I'm an ethical hacker and he made trafficking um for program that he was starting caught my attention. Um I started an NGO earlier this year. So what I do is I expose child predators uh, to the United States Department of Justice. And I was wondering how can I get involved with you um, and I want to call um you know, I'm going to see my NGO so I can bring some people to your attention. Right? Mm -hmm. Why not? Yes. Well, I'm going to have a class up there when I step in the hallway and get your attention. And I'll be honest with you, I am the, the term ethical hack. I just actually heard it for the first time about a month. I didn't know this was a thing. Uh, and it's real. And it, it is helping close cases. Not, but I've never heard the term for a month. And it's, uh, any other questions? Uh, you have a list? Okay. <laughs> she grabbed a paper for it. Uh, in the spirit of the man that her faith organization over for our school, how do you know you have a Jewish school that speaks to the event? Yeah. I am. Um, uh, so that's a great thing. So I will I'll start with this. The reason that I, I started up by saying that Charles Hamilton in Houston is my is my legal hero. Charles Hamilton in Houston had, had a, um, he was the former dean of the Howard Law School. Uh, and one of his prized pupils actually was Terry Good Marshall. And what he would challenge his law students and any black attorney. He, he talked about that we have a different charge than other attorneys. He said that either you are a social engineer for justice or you're a parasite. And so by, by having that as my philosophy as a lawyer, as a legislator, and as a judge, it causes me to have a little bit different uh, philosophy of how I handle cases. And I'll just give you, I'll give you an example. Um, counsel uh, talked about Kind of, what's, what's the third commercial phrase one more time? Okay, let me with this. We had a case, and this is just, and this was a person of color, this was a black woman uh, who was transgender. Okay, so you got, you got race, you got LGBTQ rights, and you have, and this is in the city of Detroit. At a gas station, a uh, person um, is making some advances towards, towards this uh, individual. Um, he finds out that she's transgender, and this, then he wants to attack her. And then he shoots her in, um, in this gas station. And so the uh, prosecutor, uh, it was a special prosecutor, came up with uh, a novel. As you stated, a novel uh, type of prosecution. At this time, in the state of Michigan, um, uh, a person's a person's sexual orientation they were not a protected class, so they were not a part of hate crimes legislation at all. Um, and that was something that I introduced in 2001, 2003, and 2005. 
was to add LGBT rights to our uh, Elliott Larson, which is our employment discrimination law, our hate crimes law, and our bill. Um, but at this time, there had been any action in the state of Michigan. And so I ruled that the defendant could be charged as um, with a hate crime because not that she was transgender, but because he thought she was a woman and she wasn't, that's why he attacked her. That was very novel. The, the defense um, appealed me to the uh, Wayne County Circuit Court. I was overturned. Prosecutor appealed it to the Court of Appeals. I was still overturned. Uh, the Michigan Supreme Court ruled that I was correct. And that actually, when we talked about common law in some of other classes, my decision actually became the law in the state of Michigan. And then the state Senate and the state legislature actually this year added those protections into our law. And so that was a time where just on the plain black law, black letter law, probably should probably would most judges probably would have said, no, you can't do it. But you have to do what you think is right sometimes. And that is the reason why we have courts of home jurisdiction. If you're wrong, let it be changed. And so I look at, I have a special responsibility. There's not many, I'm from the east side of Detroit, not many people that come forward and grew up, get to go to Morehouse, get to go to Case Western Reserve School of Law, get to become a legislator at 27, get to become a judge at, 30, at 37, get to become a professor here at 38. Because I've been put in some places, I gotta kind of make, I gotta kind of make it right for others who don't get that opportunity. And make it for someone to come behind. So I always look at that special responsibility as a black lawyer, as a black lawmaker, and as a black judge. It's kind of a long way to go. If you have any other questions, I'll be able to get you. Phone number at the call is 313-965-8736. Again, 313-965-8736. Look in the binder. Thank you, Judge McConnell. It's always a pleasure. So now we're going to take, we're going to take a break. Everybody can help themselves for lunch. And we're going to have some more dynamic presenters this afternoon. Don't leave. Don't change that channel. If you're a student, can you come up here? We're going to get a picture real quick. If you're a student, I know y'all want to take pictures for me. Get a quick picture. Okay. Okay. Okay.
Adam. Hello, hello, we're back in here. Yes. Pulling up to some good lunch. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the next presenter here. And uh, this is what I've known for quite a while. Um, really, he's, uh, I'll give you a bit about his resume. Captain, United States Army Reserve. State Senator uh, with the Michigan State Legislature, currently the Director of Veterans Affairs for the state of Michigan. What's interesting about him is he has levels of experience. Uh, he's a non executive, friendly legislature, um, friendly and appreciate his service in, in, in the uh, army. But before you talk to him, he, he really just proves to you without trying how much how intellectual he is, how much he knows about uh, the, the district, how much he knows about so many different fields. Uh, and just so appreciate him. I've heard him a number of times over the last couple of years about some issues that we're dealing with. So now I'm going to introduce you. Oh, absolutely. There you go. How's everybody doing there? Always uh, a change when you come right after lunch. But uh, my name is Adam Ali, and I represent uh, you. And what for you know, we think about uh, veterans, most people think about just people who have served. And I think it's important that we recognize that when one person decides to sign up, that the entire family serves, right? So uh, when I'm in uniform, people say, Thank you for your service. Uh, but they can also thank you, my wife has to go from having a husband and a father to being a single mom when I'm the way to when folks are deployed. And so when we look at uh, veterans and what it means, entire things. So uh, we have a little over half a million veterans in the state of Michigan as people who raised their right hand and said, hey, send me uh, for you. And the reason that that is so critically important is because we have an all volunteer force uh, since Vietnam, which means that everybody who has served since then said, hey, I will which is kind of a crazy thing, right? Like it, it's saying that in this moment, when all the things are happening, that you're going to go. Uh, and the reason that that's so incredibly challenging is because veterans are entitled to a lot of benefits because of their service. And too often we have service members who think that they don't need their benefits, uh, which can be deeply problematic because no one has ever said that about their tax return. So that first tax return, we got a hundred dollars back. You like get it done, those money, and you're like give me my money. Right? Whether it's five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, you're like give me my money. But we have people who have owed thousands and, from a business standpoint, millions of dollars that do not claim it. My first, the first thing I did in this job was I rec helped recognize a newly hundred and two year old man who had served during World War II. See, my only guess when he claimed his benefits. So this man got out of the military to and claimed his veteran benefits in his late 90s. And this is a black man. So he was breaking a lot of barriers, one, in living that long, but two, in all the things that were necessary that to happen. And the reason I talk about that is because as we stand here and we talk about uh, the history of the NAACP, American GIs were in the found were foundational members in this business because it was a place where you could not deny someone's ability or aptitude. So has everybody heard of Paul Harbin? You remember what just happened? Uh, around that time, we were also having these discussions about what integration looked like. And we were having those because uh, Richard Wilson, he was president, uh, segregated the civil service and made very clear that black folks did not have the same opportunities and they tried to make it clear that they did not believe that we had the same capacity or aptitudes uh world war ii was a stark reminder that that was different uh one of the heroes of pearl harbor was a black man who was stuck in uh non-combat you know kind of ships work right so he did kind of that domiciliar role he saved the captain of the ship, so now, you know, fought, repelled uh, Japanese fire. 
but he was not rewarded the way that other soldiers were initially. And we talked about that the big thing that the NAACP throughout its history, and particularly from a legal standpoint, has done has helped veterans take advantage of their benefits. Uh, and so as we talk through why that is so critically important, we are always talking about the history of segregation in this nation, right? And a lot of that discussion comes from the idea that white people left the city of Detroit because they were racist. Right? We hear that as the narrative. What we do to talk about is that they left the city of Detroit because housing was offered at low to no cost in suburban communities and by federal rules, whether that be veterans rules, right? So a significant portion of the GI Bill which provided education opportunities, housing, preferential hiring, and healthcare, those things were not allowed, were not given to, were not allowed for different service members to take advantage of. And so a lot of that segregation came because the federal government subsidized these homes for American GIs, but they were only allowed to be created in segregated communities. So you take two people, same military service, and that Black family were not able to take advantage of the opportunities that were built up around the post World War II GI benefits. And so we're like, okay, I get that context. How is that relevant to the work that you do today? It's because we see a bunch of people who came out of the military to Korea, Vietnam, that are not taking advantage of the benefits that they're entitled to. So you may have a a mother, a grandfather, a mother, a sister, a brother who served and not taking advantage of their benefits because of racism. It's critically important that as we talk about the ownership of the peace, and we're thinking about these benefits because those are a huge foundation on how we move together and move forward as a people. And a lot of it has to do with legal segregation that happened. So we are here at uh, the college. So in the military, there are lots of education benefits that you're able to take advantage of. Some you're eligible for if you serve in an active duty component, some as a reserve, some as a National Guard component. And the Michigan Veterans Affairs Agency will make those things a little less complicated because people are like, well, I'm not eligible. The answer is maybe. Very strong in the 80s, though. And the way we get the answer to that is that you give us a call and we can teach you that. So we can teach you that as well because we have a lot of the service that we want. We have to build the things that have a lot of the service that they will be eligible for a lot of the benefits. I would like to talk about this because I have a lot of topics. So I think we're not going to be able to do that. So it's connected. So if you are a black man, a black woman, who is a woman, age, right? so 60s, 70s, and you don't have any potential of high blood pressure, not only are you amazing, not only have you made a lot of really life decisions, but you can know me. And so as we talk about that, there is this presumption for the first time that. You know, and the reason I say I'm this is because too often women do not consider themselves veterans because they're like, no, it's not that. That's not the definition of a veteran. The definition is that you raise your life and your right hand and say, Sing me. But so if you have someone who raised their right hand and said, Hey, Sing me, that is who you are responsible for taking care of. It's not saying, Do you need it? It's, did you earn it? And the answer is, Right hand or not. You think the answer is yes, you earned it. But it's also me because of how much of these benefits are you able to take advantage of. And that's what we are here for as an organization. Um, a lot of people talk about relations, right? She's conversation. And most of that deals with slavery. That is not where the majority of the inequity happened. It happened between people who went to you and now. And that was because. Soldiers and the family of soldiers were not able to take advantage of these benefits. Uh, there's this really, really a great list. Okay, so I and mean, they talk about the double victory campaign. Is everybody familiar with the, the double victory campaign? It was victory abroad, victory at home. 
because um, one of my dad's elementary school teachers, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Alexander Jefferson, was Tuskegee Airman. He was shot down uh, in Germany, and he would always say he was treated better as a German POW than as a black man in America. And that was not hyperbole. Because in Germany, he had rank. So no matter what you said about his color or his creed, he was a pilot and he was an officer. And so they had an obligation to treat him a certain kind of way. And was it as good as they treated other white officers? No. But it was still better than they treated white enlisted soldiers. And that was the difference. And so as we talk about why the veteran space is so critically important, it's because these were folks where they got to have a one-to-one. -one. I always tell folks that military is the closest thing to a meritocracy besides sports, because either you can do the job or you can't. And if you can't do the job, people don't let you leave because it's people their lives. And so in these moments where you had a bunch of people and there were moments where either you did the thing or you did not, Black soldiers did it, right? And they did it in these very unique and efficient ways. We've all heard about the Tuskegee Airmen, but what we don't talk about is the reason that they were so impressive was because they stayed on mission, right? So there were lots of pilots. There were lots of folks who could fly and do the work. What the Tuskegee Airmen were able to do was they were able to stay with the bombers instead of going off and getting distracted to try and shoot down German planes. So the bombers survived. Right. For all of you who, who have served, as you know, people who have served, one of the greatest gifts that you can get uh, when you are away is mail. And particularly in the 30s and 40s, there was an all black postal unit, black women, that changed fundamentally how mail was delivered in service. Right. Tyler Perry is making a movie about it soon. So tune in. Uh, but like those women did not get recognized. Until last year, very few of them were still alive, right? That is why, as we talk about the veteran space, it's so critically important that as a community, we continue to make sure that we are entitled to everything that we earn, right? It, it changes the narrative about these things because American GIs, when they came back from World War I, were lynched because these Negroes were too uppity. Their benefits were denied. Their promotions were degraded. There were so many of these things that happened that changed the lives fundamentally of their descendants, right? So if your grandfather served in the military, you likely got housing. You got education, right? Like we talk about all those things as how it created the middle class. Well, the thing that I am excited and grateful that I've had the opportunity to do over the last year is help people correct these wrongs. Because if you serve, you are entitled to a variety of things. And sometimes we miss being able to recognize that service member. But we can support their, their wife, their children. And that's the work that we do. Uh, but most importantly, it's highlighting those who are still here and telling their stories. Because when I told you Colonel Jefferson was treated better as a POW in Germany, it said something about this nation, didn't it? You had a visceral reaction. Because you're like, I mean, you telling me he went through all that, got shot down, and the Nazis were better? Hmm. Right? I mean, they're, they're like the best bad guy of history, right? Like, you're watching a movie, and you're like, all right, who's the safe bad guy? The Nazis. They were better at taking care of Black officers than we were. And it's not that long ago. We are losing these folks and their stories have to be told. So when you know someone who served, it's so critically important that you tell their story, that you make sure that they're getting everything they are entitled to. Because for a generation, they may not have been receiving what they are entitled to. We saw in Vietnam, Black soldiers get discharged for basically being Black, but they wrote different things down. Uh, we are seeing that same thing with LGBTQ folks. Right? We know that they got put out because they were a lesbian, because they were gay, because they were trans. And on their paper, it says, 
Uh, they don't commit to good moral discipline. Right? But we heard, you heard from the attorneys talking about, and the, ju the judges, you heard from them talking about what the law says. There are people who understand what they need to write down. It is a completely different than what they actually did and how they actually do it. And so at MBAA, you have allies and folks who are going to help you work through those processes and understand how to deal with them. Because if we don't deal with these things quickly, we are going to miss that window again. Because as we talk about why these things are happening and how we are in this space, a lot of the discussion is, oh, well, they're bad people. That's why we're here. No. The structures that we have created have put us in this position. And people like George Crockett understood that you had to change those structures. Uh, at MBAA, we are trying to do that in who we identify as veterans. I have a, a, a good friend who is a trans woman. And she was getting sniped at on social media. And the guy was like, oh, you don't know nothing about, you know, combat or whatever. She was an army ranger. Now, if you didn't know that she was a trans woman, you wouldn't know that she was presenting as a man while her service happened. And you'd be like, well, she couldn't have been in combat. She couldn't have done those things. But she did, and she was. We have tons of women who fought combat missions who have done all these things. But because of the way we perceive our time and our space, we are not speaking about them, we are not recognizing, we are not talking to them in the ways that are meaningful and matter. And so at MBAA, we are trying to do that. And veterans have always been a space where we make civil rights it's happen, right? You look back at, at so many of these movies and you see this first black so-and-so in the military, it's where integration began because President Truman could actually order it. Right. Has anybody ever seen the movie Men of Honor? Right. Remember that moment where Robert De Niro walks him out and says, you know, by order of President Truman, the army, you know, the, this is all integrated. And the white boys are like, no disrespect to President Truman, but I don't bump wig. And you're like, well, did that happen? And the answer is yes. But it happened in neighborhoods. It happened in communities. And it happened when they got back. And they said, I don't go to school with them. So when we talk about access to education, talk about the law school, the reason that programs like this are so critically important, it's not just that Black folks weren't going to school, it's that they were not allowed to. And this is not 100 years ago, this is not 80 years ago, this is in the last 40, 50, 60 years where the systems did not allow people to take advantage of their benefits, and as a result, were not able to grow. We know that, and we have an obligation to fix it. And so I'm grateful that Governor Whitmer uh, appointed me and believe in this as a message and has allowed us to prioritize dealing with these issues. Uh, but it does not work unless you get your folks to talk about it, because we all know someone who has served in the military, right? And we know that many of them, particularly our Vietnam era veterans, did not have a good experience. So please reach out to them, talk to them, and encourage them strongly to take advantage of their benefits. And I will leave you with this, these kind of three points. One, service members that are connected to their benefits are, are more than six times less likely to take their own lives. You hear that? So if you get them connected with their benefits, any benefit at all, right? Just connected in any way, shape, or form. That is a life-saving undertaking. Two, service members did something that was meaningful when they were in the military. And not having meaningful employment, not having those meaningful interactions leads significantly to them taking their lives. And that's why post 9-11 GIs are something like 20 times more likely to take their lives than other people. And lastly, you have an opportunity to correct that. And the way that you do that is one, by saying more than thank you for your service, but actually making it an action. So thinking about a way that you can engage a veteran meaningfully, thinking about a way that you can talk to them, get them engaged, do those kind of things, or even just listen to their story. Because then having those connections with other people and talking through their stuff is literally saving people's lives. It's the work that we've done and continue to do. Uh, just this week, we announced that uh, through the civil service program, uh, instead of having to have a bachelor's degree for professional jobs, if you were an E6 or above, so you were in the Army and Staff Sergeant, uh, that you could go directly into professional work. And we know how incredibly important that is for us. 
right? And so as you look out into this world, I hope that you will think about ways that you can provide service to our veterans and those who have served and do so in a meaningful way, because if you don't reach out to them, we might lose them. You want me to take questions to get on stage? Get on stage. No. <laughs> Good, I'll do that. But I have the first question. Uh-oh. First question. It's not a question. Okay. I want you to go through. I'd like you to go through a series of the benefits that veterans are missing out on. Just describe them. Uh, because a lot of these folks sitting out here, they've got grandfathers, uncles, everybody, and aunts who need some benefits that they aren't getting. So that's one, the number of benefits that you can get uh, from being a veteran is astronomical. And we work every day to increase that. Uh, but the big ones are health care, right? So services at the VA. Uh, if you are dealing with suicidal ideations, the Compact Act just passed, so it gives you more rapid and immediate uh, mental health care. Um, I mean, you may know an aunt, an uncle who is aging and needs a wheelchair built, or needs a, needs a wheelchair, needs a ramp built. Uh, there are lots of folks that do that. Uh, Home Depot has a program. The VA have programs. And there are a number of community groups that will help you get your home straight just because you're aging, right? So I have a, an 87-year-old uncle, he's a Korean War vet, completely independent all his life, managed his money, did all these kind of things. Then you get old and life really comes at you extremely fast and you now should be taking advantage of the benefits that you have, right? Caregiver resources, right? So I, I never expected to be a caregiver because I have siblings and they are way better at that. But for my aunt and uncle, it was like, oh, I'm your person. I need. There are people that the VA will help cover to come out and help manage that kind of care because we all know it, it's incredibly difficult to deal with older relatives as you're working and dealing with children. There are resources from the VA that allow you to do that. And that's before we start talking about the compensation issues. Uh, let's say, for example, <clears throat> that you're young and you're healthy and you are you know, you are an entrepreneur and your business is going great. You just want to grow. You want to do more business with the state. Well, if you have even a 0% disability rating, I say that again, a 0% disability rating with the VAA, you are going to get preferential uh, deals on any contracting you do with the state of Michigan. It's almost a 10% bump. So if you and someone else have the same bid and you have a 0% disability rating, which could mean you got a little ear or something, your sense of smells off, you got a bad knee from a couple bad jumps, right? Like, if you go get checked out, that means you're going to start winning these contracts. Those are the kind of things that you can do. And you can call us at 1-800-MISHVET and do a benefit audit uh, to ensure that you are taking advantage of everything that you're entitled to. Uh, and as a nation, we are constantly coming to grips with the fact that we have done a terrible job of taking care of our veterans, and particularly our Black veterans uh, and women veterans. And trans veterans, gay and lesbian. We have done a bad job of taking care of veterans that are not just a white guy. And we have done a poor job with them, but even worse than everybody else. And so we are constantly stepping up our game in how we provide services and care. And so if you call us and do a benefit audit, we will help make sure that you're taking advantage or that your relative is taking advantage of everything they are entitled to, which means we owe you. We owe you this. Thank you for that information. My name is Adrienne Scruggs, and I'm a referee out in Washington County. I'm a Wayne County resident. I am running for circuit court judge, but that's not my question. Um, I'll give you an example, and then hopefully I can follow up and get some resources. Mm -hmm. When I was working um, as a senior attorney in Franklin Court in Wayne County, I would see people on the show cause docket. And some of those gentlemen, mostly men, uh, one of them in particular, it just resonated with me, and I've held on to this for years because he was there for an enforcement proceeding he had on his guard. And I always started off with thanking him for a servant and he just broke down. He broke down, he was struggling mentally. Um, and he, I took the time with him as I could and he would tell me how he just wanted to hit it off. He couldn't take it anymore. He went back and start talking about his service and then what was happening with his life right now. And I could not do anything in terms of connecting him 
with resources at that point because we didn't have them available. Now I gave them the party report resources and suggested, hey, maybe, you know, make an appointment. We can, you know, do something with the, with this court case or whatever, um, try to mitigate the circumstances. But I've also seen that a lot when I hear my cases for family law because it's going to be contentious in and of itself. And so they have that stressor and that struggle. And I hear a lot of the gentlemen and service persons come in and they'll tell me, you know, I'm struggling and I've got, you know, I've thought about suicide or the other person will say, yeah, you know, they've had suicides and ideation, so they shouldn't have the kids. My question in all of that is, do you have any resources that you can possibly maybe provide to the courts yeah. so that when we get those people there and they start telling us that story, I take it seriously so that I can say, listen, here's this number, here's this direct resource, call them. Or when we've had situations where we've had to, you know, extend a recording and in the background have people call in the sheriff's department to have them do a welfare check there at that. Is there that resource that we can, you know, contact ourselves as well to say, listen, you might want to go and reach out to this veteran because they're in a bad way. Yeah, so let me give there are two answers to that. Uh, first, I want to thank... Uh, Justice uh, Bolden, who's a, a good friend of mine, but she also leads the specialty court uh, section for the, the Supreme Court. So the state court administrator, the Supreme Court manages all the other courts, and they have these specialty courts. We as a state have been a leader in the veteran court space, and so veteran courts have been designed to help folks who serve and help with their unique challenges and to give them programs that move them through and forward. Because... <laughs> It's kind of an off-color joke, but uh, there's a, a, a service member uh, who said, you know, very well to do, did comfortably and all those kind of things. But he said, you know, the Air Force got a well-adjusted, good, committed 18-year-old, and they came back with this, right? Like, th this guy is broken. They owe us, right? Like, I, I did not break myself. My service had an impact, and we have an obligation as a community to support that. And so Michigan's veteran courts have done a tremendous job at doing that because they understand are, are more committed to the root cause and are operating in a more restorative mechanism. Now, criminal justice reform wasn't what I was tasked to talk about, but I will say the way we do veterans court speaks more to the kind of restorative justice and the kind of work that the NAACP has been advocating for, for all people. And if you look at it, it works because they're not trying to punish you for the thing you did. They're trying to get you right so you don't come back and recognize that you're a human and you had things and life happened. So veterans courts work. It's a model we should be doing more of. The second thing is we try to keep things simple at NBA. You call us at 1-800-MISH-VET and we will take it from there. And we will make sure that we connect you with all the services and somebody who can do more work. So when I started this job, we had identified about 130,000 of what we believe to be 550,000 veterans. Now we're at 380,000 veterans that we have identified and are able to connect with and work with. That's great. So we've doubled who we connected with, but we're still missing 200,000 people who have served. And we know that more than half of our veterans are 60 or, or older, which means these are folks who are not going to be able to tell you where they serve because they don't still have those documents because it was paper and it's not electronic and, you know, they didn't move three times. Or, or. So we have a real obligation to be helpful and to do more in this space, and you can all be a part of that. I think there was a question. Get the lady in the front. She claps. She, you know, <laughs> I have two questions. First one is I know firsthand that the red tape of the VA and most of the country's administrative agencies is expensive. So can you help me understand why service connection isn't automatic? Okay. All right. So question number one. No, it doesn't work, right? Okay. You start. You started with red tape. So uh, Richard was teasing about how I know a bunch of random stuff. Uh, Fun fact about red tape, it was a papal way of identifying things that were important. So you put red tape on the important things. And people were like, huh, this is really effective. 
So they started putting red tape on everything. So that's so when so literally red tape was supposed to make things efficient, but it doesn't because we were like, hey man, that worked for you. I'm gonna do exactly that. So we lost it. So why are we why did we not just service connect everybody? Because honestly, as a nation, we've realized we don't really want people to have their benefits. If we did, we would presume we would give them more of those things. But it is the motion we're moving in. So the compact, the PACT Act is a presumption that if you have this thing, it's likely because we screwed up. Right. But that's why it's so important for us to elect leaders and to work through this process, because there are a number of folks who pay big money, their big attorney to fight these cases. And then that person takes a portion of it when we have folks who will do this work for free. Right. It is because we live in a country where we do not believe fundamentally that people should be taken care of. Uh, and if we did, they would be taken care of differently. Right. We should just do it. So you know, send different people to Congress. <laughs> my second question is outside of talking to our personal mm -hmm. family members and connections and people we know what is your call on community to help Mitch back outside of just speaking to who we know who might need benefits what those people we know I mean that's that's a huge ask right like y'all know a lot of people Talk about it at church, do it and all these other kinds of things. But you can also do some of the other things that we do. So we have a veteran-friendly employer and a veteran-friendly schools program. Uh, and what those programs allow us to do is to make it easier to hire veterans, uh, to make it easier for veterans to go to school in these communities. And it makes a huge difference, right? So Wayne County Community College is special because it understands the population and understands who come here and why they come here and don't go other places. Uh, Veterans, you know, at 17, I went to basic training with people who were 17 years old, taught them how to vote, taught them how to register to vote, right? Like they had never done anything. I was 30. They were like, hey, old man. I was like, yeah. I was like well, I will run you into the ground. Uh, but that's the thing. We are in a space where people don't understand what it's like because most people haven't served, right? Like you compare the United States today to a country like Israel. Right, where everyone at 17, 18 has this universal service requirement, they all know what it's like. You go back to World War II, everybody in their family had somebody who served, right? Like your dad served. And if he didn't, people were like, why are you serving them? You know, that's a very different experience today. So you have to peel these, these onions back. You got to get people to talk about it. You got to talk about church. You got to think about it. How does your employer, how does your school, how does the place that you work in lend itself to veterans? The same discussion that we have about inclusivity on all things, right? Like it's easy to walk into a business and say, oh, y'all don't, don't know what it's like to be a woman because they're like, oh, you, you can nurse in this janitor's closet on the bathroom. It's like, no, I don't want to nurse in the bathroom. Like that's the same thing is true about service members, right? And the type of work and the kind of spaces that you put them in. We have this uh, challenge, especially as people are thinking about affordable housing, right? And shelter space. So imagine you are somebody who's dealing with PTSD and uh, location, like being able to maintain your location and your space, which is why we know that a number of veterans choose to live on the streets as opposed to going to shelter because they want to be able to control their space. They can't be around such a large crowd. And so it's understanding those things and for you to think about it and internalize it in the work that you do and how the work that you do can positively impact veterans and their families. And I would say the big thing is their families because I'm going to be all right, right? But the days that I'm gone, my two kids are like, daddy, where, you know, right? like that extra child care cost for folks as they're deployed, that extra loss of, you know, having somebody else have to teach your kid how to catch football, ride a bike, or do some of those kind of things because you miss those moments. Those are the things that we can do a be much better job of. And lastly, understanding that veteran is not man. Soldier does not mean man, right? That lots of women serve, an increasingly large number of women serve. And if we don't have our systems designed for them, we will continue to miss out. For sure. I'm just, I'm just oh, there we go. Just struck by your the one of many facts you laid out how the, the reparations comment really is dealing with you know within the last sixty or seventy years essentially, and it's something that uh, just you know is is a gripping fact. 
you know, in, in litigation, we have a concept of class action where if there's something that's owed to someone, the person who may not know about it is sitting at home, whatever, gets a notice in the mail from the court saying, you're entitled to this benefit. And unless you say, I don't want it, I'll send you a check in another six months, a year, whatever it takes to get the litigation to them. Just wondering if something like that has ever been thought about because, you know, obviously there's these, this, this large group of people who are entitled to all this benefit and may not know, may not ever know. And is, is there some way to amass the list of every person who's entitled to everything and say, let's make sure they get it? I wish the answer was yes. It's something that, that we've been trying to work through. But there's some things, uh, like we, we started this conversation about reparations, like there's some things that we can say systematically, uh, there is what we would call de jure segregation, right? So <clears throat> after World War II, the nation built the suburbs. And in doing so, it was not white people that put these restricted covenants in that made this problem like it, it, as some like, hey, this guy in the back room. It was the federal government said, hey, Randy, you're going to do this development right here. You're going to build these hundred houses. They're going to be all white. Brandon wanted to build integrated housing. They're like, no, 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 you will build all white housing. And as a result, American GIs who would otherwise have been eligible for these programs and be able to use their benefit were systematically not allowed to do so. Right. We know that that happened. Uh, when we talk about the education benefit, we know that there were tons of institutions that denied service members uh, the ability to take advantage of their GI benefits on mass, on record. The challenge is most of those people are no longer alive. So you can say, hey, that child, you know, the children are there or whatever are the ones who are harmed. And, and that's where we saw this income inequality come from. It's from that housing, it's from that education. And it was very clear that as a government, we prevented those things from happening. So, I mean, you know, you love a good long shot. I'm always down to, to take that, to take it to town with you. But we, those are the kind of things that as a community, we've got to be thinking about and fight for. The NAACP uh, talked about that and fought a significant number of these cases 60 years ago when they were talking about these developments because developers wanted to build integrated housing and they were not allowed. Um, honorable. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question. Um, my concern is the health care of women who serve in the military. Um, I have I know of a lot of women who have high risk pregnancies or um, and when they deliver and there is not a neonatal unit at the VA hospital. Or how does a woman who is high risk get service from the veterans hospital when that service really doesn't exist. And many of the women in the military have a high um, mortality rate. Um, if you're a woman, you, you know, chances are you're going to get pregnant if you're in that age range. So um, what is being developed to provide those services without the red tape to women serving in the military? So really important question, right? So uh, my wife uh, had two little kids in, in the time where she would have considered high risk. Uh, she was, our, our oldest was delivered eight weeks early, seven to, uh, and spent a, you know, a week in the NICU, right? Like it was an emergency C-section, like all of those kind of things happen. They happen disproportionately amongst black women. Black women are significantly less likely to survive pregnancy. Uh, than women of any other color. And the interesting point is socioeconomic status does not matter. So being what being a wealthy black woman or being a poor black woman doesn't make any difference. Being a black woman is the thing that is determined. And so are we doing enough to deal with this? The answer is categorically no. And the thing that we have to do to address that is by constantly saying women serve, black women serve. And as a result, black women have specific needs. Uh, women have specific needs, and we need to be thinking about them. Uh, the state of Michigan spent, well, either 12 or $22 million 
can't remember my, my number now. It's a significant difference, but revolutionary, right? Like amount of money this year in this budget to modernize the National Guard uh, facilities to add bathroom parity, right? So if you've ever gone to, uh, for all the dudes, I don't know what I'm talking about, but for all the ladies, you know exactly what we're talking about, right? We go to a space and the way the building codes have been designed, you have the same square footage for bathrooms, right? So that's, that's how building codes work. You have the same square footage for bathrooms. So like if you draw a line down here, women's, men's. Men's bathrooms take up less space, right? So you can put a significantly high number of stalls. And so that's why the men's line moves faster. What we're talking about now is designing these facilities so that they actually serve a similar number of people in a similar amount of time. Uh, and so at the National Guard space, it was like, all right, we have one shower for women and like uh, 70 showers for men. Because there was a time where the Guard was 95% men. Uh, and as those things change, as we're starting to transition, it's recognizing that these things should be more equitable. We should have facilities that allow women to, to take care of it. Uh, similarly, we also have to be talking about these things regularly, which means when we talk about veterans, when we highlight veterans, we should be highlighting women. Uh, so we launched an I'm a veteran, I serve campaign, and we highlighted a Black woman who had to deal with these kind of issues as part of her service, right? And, and that's how we talk about it. That's how we get these things to change by saying, hey, look, this is who we're talking about. She is who we're talking about. Our services have to be with her in mind. And if we do that, then we say, oh, well, what does she need, in fact? And you get some of these answers. So I think I'll, all right. Thank you so much. Oh, one more. Uh oh, look, I know it's coming now. <laughs> I'm excellent. Um, my question is, um, I know that they have uh, programs in terms of in the for veteran courts. Can you explain some of the programs and initiatives or potential initiatives for those uh, veterans who are in our prison systems? Yeah, so Michigan is, is really a leader in this regard. So the question was, what do we do for service members once they're already incarcerated? One, we are starting to do, uh, we have a veterans village where we're, there are increased uh, programming. So the kind of support stuff, the dealing with discharge. So your discharge really does matter. So there is an honorable discharge. There is an other than honorable discharge and a dishonorable discharge. A dishonorable discharge is literally the worst thing that could happen to you in your life. It makes you ineligible for almost everything. It makes you almost unemployable. And people got them, as, I, you know, as we said before, for being Black, for being gay, for being trans, for being a woman, for being, you know, for a variety of things that were outside of their control because our systems were not designed for us. Uh, so one of the things that we do in the system is help folks with discharge upgrades uh, so that you can go from a dishonorable to an other than honorable or even to an honorable discharge uh, because maybe <clears throat> what was unacceptable then, we now understand now. So during World War II, there was this thing called shell shock, uh, and we call people deserters. Do you know what we call that today? PTSD. Mm. Because we know that something about serving in the military, about being in combat, or even not being in combat, can mess something up, right? I, I had an uncle who uh, was drafted, served during Vietnam, and he spent his entire service in Hawaii. You're like, oh, that sounds great, right? Everybody who went to basic training went straight to Vietnam. Only one of his friends came home. And so he lived with survivor's guilt for his entire life because luckily his mom made him learn how to type. He could type 90 words a minute. So he ended up in Hawaii while all his, it's just like 90 words a minute is a lot. Uh, <clears throat> he ended up in Hawaii in paradise while his friends were dying in a war that they couldn't fathom. And he still came back. And when people said, what'd you do in the war? He said, I was in Hawaii typing, right? Like it, so even amongst those who came back, there was this dissonance. And so that leads people down all kinds of different roads where you get in trouble, where you get connected to substance abuse because you weren't getting the kind of health care because they gave you this kind of discharge. And so you got addicted to pain meds, right? 
we had an issue with opioids in our community, starting with Vietnam for a long time. Uh, when prescription drugs became an issue in other people's communities, it became an opioid epidemic, not a heroin epidemic. All these people were ODing on heroin. They were dying from heroin in the street. But we called it an opioid epidemic because it made it not black. Right? And so as we talk about what we're doing in the prison system, it's recognizing how people got there and understanding what is necessary to get them out. And that's skills, it's employment, it's opportunity. So as we go back to that, that idea, we got to hire our veterans, we have to understand who they are. It's saying, hey, we're going to give them the skills that they need in these institutions, we're gonna clear their record, we're gonna change these kind of things, we're gonna make sure they have basic stuff like an ID and an address. Because you can't get a job without an ID and an address. And if you say you have military service, people wanna know about your discharge, and if your discharge says dishonorable or other than honorable, it starts to lead to a lot of questions. And you don't get the job if on the first day they say, well, why'd you get kicked out of the army? Kicked out. Huh. All right, we'll, we'll go to the next one. You don't get a chance to say you got kicked out because your commander was racist. You don't get a chance to get kicked out because you say your commander sexually assaulted you. You don't get a chance to say all the things that we know lead people down these roads because you didn't have an advocate. Judge McConnell talked to you about how Detroit used to be the capital of foreclosures until the city council decided that they were gonna help people have counsel. And once you had counsel, you had someone who can advocate for you. They were like, well, I wasn't paying my rent because I didn't have heat and I wasn't gonna pay them for no heat. Or yeah, I paid them, but they weren't paying the electric bill. And I got noticed that they weren't paying the electric bill. So I started paying the electric bill instead of paying my rent. But like, those are the kind of things that come up in these things that come up when you have counsel that come up when you have an advocate. And that's our job at MBAA to be your advocate. So you don't have to become an expert. You don't have to learn all the things. All you have to learn how to do is call 1-800-MISH-VET. Yeah. Because then you get us being your advocate. You get us and all the experience that we have and all the work that we know how to do committed to working for you. Because that's what you pay your taxes for. That's why you send us into these spaces. And as you talk about all the things that we need to change, there are a lot of things that we need to change. But those require elections. Right now, you need advocates who can fix things and work through the systems as they exist today. <laughs> anyway, we now have all of these marijuana dispensaries mm -hmm. and service members um, have access to those marijuana as I understand it, in the military, uh, there are rules time and time about using drugs, including marijuana. Correct. So it's legal in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But if you're stationed in Michigan and they are, they find they're telling you to hold the mic close to your face, they find out that you're using it, then all of a sudden you're open to court martial. Correct. So just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, Marijuana, still illegal, right? Just flat out still illegal federally. So if you are serving actively in the military, it is still not legal, uh, unless you have a prescription or, or some of those kind of things. So there are a lot of things, revolutionary uh, breakthrough uh, therapies, as they say, for service members around PTSD. And I, I say breakthrough because that's literally the technical term. They're like breakthrough treatments uh, of using LSD, marijuana, uh, Mushrooms, psilocybin, psilocybin. Um, there's another one. Um, what's 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 Molly? Uh, yes, MDMA. So there are lots of things that are being tried uh, among service members that you can get as a part of your care that you are allowed that you may be allowed to take with a prescription. So the big thing on those things is one, consult your medical professional. And two, consult your JAG, so your attorney, you know, the military's version of your attorney on what you can and can't do and understand your rights because, you know, as has always been the case, they will throw the book at us. Make sure you have somebody on your side to take care of. I think that's me getting the hook. So we have right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
the open right law and I'm going to ask Richard, can you come up? We, we've got a one more fabulous presentation this afternoon. And I'd like you to introduce this person for us, if you would, please. Uh, yet again, this young man I've worked with for a number of years. Uh, he's with me as the uh, director on the NAACP uh, Detroit Branch Board. Uh, and again, another intellect. Uh, you all are getting a wealth of knowledge from some great intellectual people this afternoon. Brandon Jessup is his name. He is currently the principal for Moving Forward, the deputy director of data analytics and movement technology. They work with state voices. Uh, and he's just going to bring you uh, some, a little bit of everything. He's just a very, very intellectual cat. Uh, always, again, learning something from him when I talk to him. So, Brandon, floor is yours, my friend. Here we go from Brandon Jeff. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to try to, um, I'm not going to be the one I hold up. Uh, so, we did brief in the day, so I'm going to be as succinct as possible. Y'all have, have, um gotten a ton of information today and i'm gonna walk through the legislative and executive branches of michigan government um as richard said earlier i'm the deputy director of data analytics and movement technology state voices state voices is the largest network of progressive community groups um, across the united states with state tables in 25 states um, over 1200 partners if someone sent you a text message reminding you like hey do you have a plan to vote? Well, it's probably from State Voices, one of our affiliates. If um, you've heard of any, if you've followed the redistricting case in Alabama, um, Evan Mulligan is one of our state directors in the state of Alabama. So when we talk about, I'm gonna talk about redistricting for a little bit, but when it comes down to the fact that the movement is more than just like the march and the mobilization, we are data informed, we're informed by the information that we collect, and like, yes, we need more people of color to participate in the data collection process. Um, and redistricting is a, is a huge case of that, an example of that. Um, so I'm gonna touch on redistricting in a second, but I believe all of you should have the citizens guide the government, um, either at your table or something like that. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna kick it off on page 13. Um, I'm a person that loves diagrams and graphs and all that kind of stuff. And the table that you will find on page 13 talks about three branches of government. Um, Chief Chief Justice, um, forecasting to the future. <laughs> Justice Go <laughs> Bolden um, talked about the judicial branch. And also, um, uh, uh, Mr. McConnell walked through a lot of their suggestion court and how that operates. I'm going to focus right now on the executive branch of government. Okay. So at the end of 2022, um, we closed out. The, the electoral process, and everyone said, hey, look, great, Michigan's got a trifecta. And I stopped and I said, what does that really mean, right? So the trifecta means that like, yes, Democrats hold all three branches of government, the two branches of government, and they have a majority in the judicial branch. Now, yes, we are the NAACP, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We don't care what you put behind your name as far as the office that you hold. Right, it's more about the job that you do in that office, and with the executive branch, these are the folks who execute, right, and they enforce the laws that the legislature passes. Okay, so yes, you got the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, great. She is the head appointee, our chief, our chief executive officer, if you want to see it that way. Garland Gilchrist, a lot of folks says, well, what does the lieutenant governor do? That is the president of our Senate. Okay. So he is the 39th vote, if you want to look at it that way. Um, this is the first time a Black person, a Black male specifically, has held that seat. All right, so we need to recognize that, like, yes, not only in 2018 did we elect a Black man to represent Michigan as its lieutenant governor, this is the first time in our history, and we've also reelected a Black man to be lieutenant governor in this state. So let's give our, our own social media round of applause for that. Yeah, or for agency. In government, in, in government. Um, 
So yes, so now we have the attorney general, right? Our state's lawyer, um, Dana, Dana Nassel, um, y'all know she's done a good guy who work regarding women's rights, um, making sure some of these bad guys go to jail. We know about the folks who called themselves um, kidnappers of our governor a few years ago. Um, she led the, the effort to try to get these folks to jail. Unfortunately, some of them were acquitted a couple weeks ago. Um, and then finally, my favorite office, the Secretary of State. Ms. Jocelyn Benson um, is a pioneer when it comes to, to leading what democracy looks should look like in the 21st century. The Department of State are the folks who handles like, yes, registration, my birthday just passed, I'm getting old. Um, so if anybody had to do, y'all know we got to deal with cars and all that kind of stuff, but the more important parts, right? The parts that make a difference, the parts that made January 6th important and whether or not Michigan had the right stuff going to, to Congress on January 6th, 2021, that was really held in the hands of our Secretary of State. So on top of being the Chief Election Administrator in the state of Michigan, she is the person that keeps all the records. So that office is hugely important when we think about how things flow in the state and how things operate. Now, what's really neat in the executive branch is there are 18 departments. Um, Adams has talked about as, as an appointee of the, um, to the Military Veterans Affairs Department of the various things that he handles is as an appointee in the Veterans Affairs space. But we also have the Board of Education, which is elected. All right, you got your Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Growth. You've got, you've got um, the Department of State Police, which just named a Black man in chief, I believe, a week and a half ago. Shout out to the NAACP for our advocacy there. Um, me being the total nerd and, and technology geek that I am, um, the Department of Technology Management and Budget. So, hey, when we think about how much is this stuff going to cost, okay, like that department handles a lot of those things. Um, the Civil Service Commission, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, over 70% of this state is rural, okay? So that department is huge when we talk about USDA, we talk about the things that we grow in this state, how it is going to be developed and how we develop land. That department is huge, huge in that conversation. Department of Treasury, you know, tax time is coming up. I'm gonna talk about that. <laughs> we gonna talk about that. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services, right? We talk about like how a lot of the, the various services that that are legislated for, right? The things that we put into our budget, the things that we ask for um, as as residents here in the state of Michigan. That department, right there, the Department of Human Services works closely with the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs about how we deliver services back to the community. A lot of our children, right, when you have a child in the state, HHS is hugely important in how they either, if you choose to do immunizations, those types of things, they handle a lot of those records in those spaces. Um, the pandemic, the Department of Health and Human Services were really first responders in designing how this state would lead this charge to make sure that we didn't have um, a pandemic sweep all through this entire state. So once again, these 13, I'm sorry, 18 departments, right, are the things that the governor oversees. She appoints a reference to all of these, all of these departments, and they all make up the executive branch of government. Now, um, I talked about the roles a little bit, and I want to just remind y'all that in 2026, all four of those elected offices will be vacant. Okay, so now we have to start to plan and we talk about black advocacy, our political advocacy and our agency, right? Like how are we designing ourselves for, for progress and for success in the future? Okay, yes, next year is 2024, president, all that stuff is going on. So at the NAACP, we always like to stay ready so we ain't got to get ready. Right. So when we had these conversations about like, yes, like how are we going to affect the folks who sit in the executive branch, like, yes, the conversations, the things we hold them accountable to now makes a difference as to how folks will see how that office performed in 2026, right? So we often hear, oh, Black folks not engaged. That's a joke of mission. That's a full joke of mission. I'll tell you why. So as we talk about the legislative branch, you got two houses, right? Mm -hmm. You got the Senate, which has 38 seats. You also had a house which has 110 seats. I'm gonna to refer to both of those departments as the upper and the lower chamber, okay? So in 2020, we all took the census. I hope you took the census. If you didn't, you ain't gotta tell me about it. I ain't gonna tell, tell on you. But what I will say is that 
what was very important from that census was the redistricting process. Okay. And like, yes, Detroit holds a goo gob of the black vote and a goo gob of the black electorate in the state of Michigan. Over 400,000 black folks out of the 600,000 black folks that registered to vote in this state, I'm sorry, 720 some odd thousand registered for active voters in the state of Michigan. Over 400,000 of them are active and registered in Southeast Michigan. Okay. So when we talk about representation, right, when we talk about like communities of color, we have to think about ourselves as moving past the, the municipal boundaries and the county boundaries that we all know about around our residency. And this year's, this last redistricting process challenged us in various ways as to how do we measure Black, Indigenous, and people of color's representation in the state house and especially in the state senate. Now, over the last 20 years, Michigan hasn't really lost any population. So we've never lost any seats in our state legislature. Okay, we've been losing seats and hemorrhaging seats in Congress. I'll talk about that at another time. But right now, we haven't lost any seats in the upper or lower chambers of the House. The only thing that has changed is how those seats would be divided up against the state. Okay, mm -hmm. so in the legislature this year, for the first time ever, we have a black person serving as speaker of the house, Mr. Joe Tate from the state from down here in Detroit. Yeah. Now, our legislature has had 102 sessions. Each of those sessions has lasted two years. So for 204 years, there hasn't been a black person that has led the lower chamber of the Michigan legislature for 204 years. Think about that. When we think about reparations, right, and how we repair folks and how folks are active in their community, that's an obvious sign that either your marriage worked <laughs> for over 200 some odd years. And then also, as we got past the civil rights movement and we began to realize our political power as Black folks, that it still took another 60 years before we elected a Black person to lead the lower chamber of the House, the People's House, okay? So let's think about that in the space. But what what's really cool about the Michigan legislature, legislature as you turn to uh, page 17, this is where laws are made, right? This is where all the sausage is made. I think I'm dealing with a, a somewhat light, younger audience here. So does anyone remember Schoolhouse Rock? Raise your hand. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So y'all know the whole rhyme about just being in the building, being on Capitol Hill. I don't have to embarrass myself up here with that. Can anybody, if, if anybody want to leave me in the course, oh, I'm just a bill. There you go. Oh, Capitol Hill. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. See, there we go. There we go. We got to get her a mic. We got to get her a mic. So, Michigan is a beautiful space, right? We mimic the same process that we have federally, where, yes, like legislators, sometimes they come up with great ideas. And they put it on paper. Well, let's be honest, it's, it's 2023, and we don't have a lot of legislatures that put a lot of great ideas on paper. Okay. But either or way, legislation is generated by members of the legislature. From that point, in the state house, there are two readings that are required. Okay. If the legis if the legislation generates in the Senate, there's only one reading. We'll talk about that later. So after the first reading by title. That legislation goes to committee. Now, in the Michigan House of, of, of Representatives, the lower house, there are 23 committees. They're identified on page 63 of the guide that you have in front of you. All of those standing committees, they meet at least once a month, okay? And you'll also see the schedule in that guide as well about when those, those committees meet. And I believe the times are in there as well. You'll also be able to find a chair of each of those committees. So if you find that in your, your state house district, your representative is a chair of said committee, you have a whole lot of agency as to what that committee considers and also how legislation is introduced. So me and myself, I got a great legislation by the name of Donovan McKinney. He helped us to pull together a lot of these, these um, citizens guys here. And like, yes, like because of him. I have outlet to talk about criminal justice reform. 
Okay, he's a very influential member of the of the criminal justice committee. He's not a not a leader yet. This is his first term in office. We'll talk about that later in a couple of years. But the fact is, is that knowing like what your folks in, in the state legislature are doing, what their assignments are, help you to direct them when they make policy. Okay. Now, one thing about the state house is anyone we talked about term limits earlier. In the state house, folks can serve three consecutive terms, three consecutive two-year terms. All right. So that's roughly six years in the state house. Okay. Now, in the in the state senate is two consecutive terms, and each term is four years. Now, one of the things that makes this conversation about the legislature really awkward is when the sausage is being made in committee, okay, going up the landscape and being in the middle of that whole entire space. Sometimes these bills can sit for months if that committee member does not want to see it move forward. I've been there. I've totally been there. I'll talk about that story in a minute. And so if the docket isn't complete by the end of the legislative year, meaning like January, I'm sorry, December of next year, if this 102nd legislature's um, session doesn't pass, whatever they don't pass, whatever they don't consider, whatever doesn't move out of committee, it dies. It will need to be introduced, reintroduced anew in the next session of the legislature. All right. So, yes, we've seen a lot of things move early this year regarding reproductive freedom, civil rights, voting rights. And now your Michigan legislature is in a slow churn of deciding their budgets for the next two years right now. So when you hear your legislators get eerily quiet, you need to call them and ask them what they're doing because they're probably talking about some money. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the to the Senate chambers. And as I said earlier, um, the Senate chamber is presided by the by the lieutenant governor. He serves as the president, president pro tem of the Michigan Senate. There are 38 seats, okay, in the Michigan Senate. All right. Now, one of the cool parts about, about being in the Michigan Senate, and we have some friends from the NAACP in the Michigan Senate, um, the chair of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. Sarah Anthony, used to be um, youth and college president of the Central Michigan University NAACP. And you see now she's still pushing forward, doing a lot of great things in the legislature. I believe she was the um, sponsor of the Crown Act here in Michigan. So when we talk about the legacy of the NAACP, you see it shining bright, right in the state legislature, state in the state Senate. Um, but let's be honest, the Senate is a slow moving body, it's the upper chamber for a reason. Okay. Um, and to be quite honest, Quite honest, this year you probably won't see as much stuff push out you've seen over the last three years when Republicans were in control. Now, like I started earlier, right, a bill may be introduced in the legislature, either in the lower chamber or in the upper chamber. Before anything leaves from committee, I'm sorry, before anything moves on to the governor's office, you need to get a bill that is, what's the word I'm looking for, that is agreed upon in both houses, okay? Now, like, yes, yeah, so let's say we're talking about voting rights. That means that both sides will have to be exactly the same. Whatever recommendations or, or adjustments have been made, amendments have been made to that committee on the House side, it has to be reflected on the Senate side. And there's a joint committee that has members from both the Senate and the State House to discuss when they need to have those joint committee conversations around legislation. Once a piece of legislation survives both committees, it has the majority, simple, simple majority vote out of both houses, and it's been, um, it's been, uh, what's what I'm looking for, collaborating on by both houses. It goes to the governor for signing and signature. Now, this year, things haven't been too contentious, um, but in the past, I believe in 2020, 2022, Governor Whitmer was very active vetoing a lot of legislation. Right, because Republicans were sending stuff that for me and for all of us, we know weren't necessarily useful for our communities. This year, you haven't seen much veto action, so that's good. Now, let's just say that the stuff that Lansing is putting out, it ain't hitting on nothing, like my dad would say. It's not bringing you no tax relief. It's not making the roads get built any faster. It's not improving our schools. Is there an avenue for citizens in Michigan to take to introduce legislation to the Michigan legislature. Anybody know? Raise a hand. 
<laughs> Go ahead, Brother Woods. Uh, lobby. That's one way. That's one way. Is there a way that citizens can, can introduce legislation to the legislature for consideration? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's advocacy. That's lobbying advocacy. Um, so we got we got lobbyists, we got lobbying, and yes, direct contact to legislators is the best way to, for for individual advocacy. The um, and this is where rubber has meets the road when we talk about like the reality of, of legislation and what really happens on the ground, right? So for over two hundred years, we've been hearing like, yeah, you got the right to vote in Michigan, and in Michigan, all that really led to was one line that said, if you're eighteen, you can register and vote. That's it. It didn't stop legislatures from introducing voter ID laws. It didn't stop legislatures from saying, you know what, like if your machine don't count the stuff backwards, you can't have it. It didn't stop um, fake electors from signing faulty documents and flying on out to DC and saying like, yeah, we electors too, right? The whole electoral process literally was just one sentence. And so in 2018, um, promote the vote led by the NAACP and uh, uh, ACLU and League of Women Voters put together a whole suite of legislative changes that was a constitutional amendment to expand voting rights. It gave us the right to have an absentee ballot. It gave us the right to have a early vote, right? And so those seven tenets that we used to expand voting rights were led by citizens through a ballot initiative. And so a lot of times what we have is it's like, yeah, we have direct lobbying, calling, writing, sometimes protesting at the doorstep of some of our legislators when necessary. We have lobbyists, um, the larger organized paid um, institutions that advance issues. We could talk about lobbying on another on another day. Um, big shout out to Citizens United. Um, but then you have Michigan, which is one of 13 states that actually has a citizen-led ballot initiative process. So the people in Michigan can introduce a constitutional amendment. The people in Michigan can introduce a referendum to overturn a piece of legislation that they find to see as unconstitutional. And the people can also introduce new initiatives and legislation directly to the legislature for consideration. So can anybody recall when the last time the Michigan legislature increased minimum wage? They haven't this century. They haven't this century. They haven't done it in the last 25 years. The last increase that the legislature made that wasn't induced by the citizens brought, I think it stopped at $4.15. Wow. So if we were waiting, we would be at line with Florida when you would consider what a minimum wage is right now. Okay. But because of ballot initiatives in the process, you had a a systematic increase that would adjust with the cost of living to get us to at least a ten dollars an hour in the state of Michigan. Okay, so and in Ohio right now they're doing them with the same thing, like raising minimum wage. Like they have to do it through citizens initiatives because they're so gerrymandered. Republicans not going to even consider passing legislation on their own end, even though eighty percent of the state makes less than fifty thousand dollars a year. You understand? So we got to be honest is that, like, yes, while democracy, our democracy has been alive for over 400 some odd years, at least it's been trying to be alive for that long. And in the state, you've got about two centuries of practice. Our legislatures and our, and our elected officials sometimes are far removed from the realities of the state and the things that we face on a daily basis. So the people in many instances have to come together and tell the legislature what to do. So you do that at the ballot box by who you elect. And the concept of shared governance, right? If they're not coming back to their districts, if they're not coming back to talk to you about what's going on, well, you need to get them out of there. And you don't have to wait every two years for something to change. Our citizens-led processes in the state allow a lot of things to happen. If it wasn't for that, um, I think our state would be looking a lot different. So with that, y'all, that was 
the succinct run through of the executive and legislative branch of the government. Um, I'll open up for questions um, or just insights on how policy works here in the state. And um, I appreciate y'all time. No, they don't. Yeah, that's a revision on the term limits. Uh, uh, it's 12 years. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So 12 for the House? 12 is, is Senate and House. In 12 years total? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, so explain that to me, Dr. Woods. Like, well, well you can do uh, four years in the uh, Senate, and then you can do the rest in the House. You can do uh, a couple years in the House and do the rest in it. And so it just affects the House and the Senate. It don't affect it don't affect the governor's office, Secretary of State, or the uh, Attorney General. Which mix would you prefer? Would you do two years in the House, four years in the Senate, and go back to the House? Uh, I just take the governor's seat. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. They want to execute. Um, any more questions or, or just comments around the Michigan legislative process? Okay, remember when Judge McConnell was saying, like, I want you to know the district courts come on down and catch me in action. Would you say that that's a good way to get abreast with the details you delegated to us to go down and watch it happen? Um, Yes, in committee, committee sessions more way more important. Um, the committees, and especially like the first hearings and the first readings of, of some of these pieces of legislation, like it's important to have people in there in the room just to keep people from just like flying through the agenda. Um, that's at the committee level is where most public comment is had. So like uh, if there's no one in there, like if you're in the room, you can just say comment and say, you know what? From what I read, this legislation sucks. I sit down. Like you can do that. Um, on But uh, yeah, if you if you got the time, go sit on the, the committees, um, and especially the appropriations committees right now, because that's where budget is being decided, right? We're talking line item by line item by line item. The Senate of Appropriations Committee has 13 subcommittees by itself, okay? So when they're talking about money, they break it up into 13 different pockets, and then out of those 13 pockets, they bring one budget up for consideration to the body, okay? So when we're talking about like school aid, I'm in all of those meetings right now. I'm in all those meetings. So thank you. Here I am, right here. Hi, Adrian Scruggs again. I just had a screen. I appreciate the intro music. Right, thank you, you. Scruggs for Judge. I appreciate Thanks, that music. Bro. Um, just, I guess, a, a, a part of the, the question that I had and part comment is that, you know, we know Wayne County is like the largest county in the state of Michigan. The front of the court uh, at Wayne County happens to be the eighth largest in the country. 
Um, mm -hmm. I worked with a friend of the court, I can give you all those details. But with that, um, you know, they took four seats from the circuit, Wayne County Circuit Court, um, despite the vast amount of cases that the circuit court sees and now they're drowning and struggling a little bit. They've given part of my question. the need for those additional seats. And the other comment I'll make, I wasn't here um, when Judge McConico was giving his update, but in terms of the watching the hearings, there are a lot of court watchers. You don't have to physically be present in the courthouse to watch the hearing. You can go on that court's website um, and you can log in as a member of the public because the hearings majority are by way of Zoom. It is a public forum unless they close those hearings for a particular reason because of sensitivity or whatever. You're entitled to observe it. So you can go and watch multiple hearings um, from the comfort of your home at the Wayne County Courts, the District Courts, Washington County Circuit Courts, where I am sitting uh, right now. Um, so I want to get that information and then also ask the question. No, um, thank you for that information. Um, yes, thank God for the digital age, right? So we can we can be remote. Um, so two things when it comes down to the allocations of course and court services. Like one, going back to committees and assignments, like yeah, hey, <clears throat> I can't remember the name of the house committee that talks about like that that space. That's the first I would look at the allocations of the court because like. Yeah, we can talk about populists, but the court, the caseload is what folks will look at, right? And so folks do weird things and say, oh, well, the caseload in the last few years is going down for X, Y, and Z. Who knows? Marriage isn't working. Like, that's good stuff. But that doesn't mean that demand is going to shift, right? So the, the fact is, I think a lot of legislatures um, make budget cuts because they're just going to look at throughputs and not necessarily service, right? And so, like, judicial services is almost a mountain of competition around the court's court. You know what I'm saying? 15 years ago, right? 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, and that, like, yeah, like you need the capacity because, like, this is a community of over 2 million people, right? Like, so moving courts, moving seats away means that we can process less. We would always want to make sure that the courts in Wayne County are leading, right? As far as like the process and getting stuff closed out, make sure we do things efficiently. And so I would say that, like, the the legislators that represent all of Wayne County, like the Wayne Caucus, that's the first conversation that the caucus needs to have. The, the county has a ton of votes when you think about the state legislature and also the state Senate, and that's where the conversation needs to be had. Um, we don't share as one of the good things about redistricting is that now some legislators, a lot of legislators represent two counties, right? Like I live in Macomb. So my legislator, my state house rep, um, represents part of Detroit and part of Warren and Centerline. So when he advocates, he's advocating on behalf of two counties. And so we got to be kind of careful because due to regionalization, right, the result might be, oh, well, let's just share the caseload across all three or four or five or seven counties and create a whole new system. So we got to be clear with some people about like our residency, the people who may represent multiple communities that, hey, no, I need this for Wayne County. I need this for Detroit. And then legislator needs to be comfortable in saying that and standing on that because they're going to be elected for that. So, you know, I think that's, that's just a caveat I would raise about this newer framework after redistricting because before Detroit was synonymous with Wayne County, that's all it was. But that's not the case anymore. And that's not the case for around, I think, eight legislators. All right, we want to thank Brandon and all of our presenters today. And I want to be aware of the fact that presenters brought up a lot of issues, many of which are going to be detailed in the coming weeks. You got your folder right in the front of the folder. It's got all your dates and the subjects that are going to be covered. So even though Judge McConnell, for instance,
touch base about evictions and whatnot. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about homeowners and renters' rights, which is going to include evictions. So do come back in the coming weeks and participate. Now, what we've done today is just the beginning. But as I indicated earlier, it doesn't just happen by itself. It happens because we have good leadership. We've got the Reverend Dr. Wendell Anthony, who has served as our president for quite a long time. But now we also got a wonderful person serving as our executive director, Ms. Camilla Landrum. And it is through her leadership and that of Reverend Anthony that we were able to partner with schools like WC3 and put these programs on. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next week with a brand new show. Oh, no. I'm sorry.